My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet, loving dog. She was an emotional support dog, but she was trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped anyone, and she had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terrier at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I'm a female, and at the time I was 11, I was at home with my two-year-old brother and six-year-old sister. My then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead-end road at the time. You had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer, having a grand time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden, all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua per up, they bark a few times and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, fur standing on end, her tail straight up. And then she barks, loudly. I mean... I mean the bark booms through the living room and echoes around. All of a sudden she lunges off the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've heard her bark, ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound. But this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it, knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I open the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair. Sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas, and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion, because I definitely don't know this man, and I ask him what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin. He spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there, kiddo. I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seems so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was there in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property and that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpets. Well, it works on other things, and he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even have a lock, 
so it was basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen, and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I have before it does happen. When all of a sudden I hear it, Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth. Her ears were down, and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway. As I let Punky out, along with the rest of our dogs, and they started chasing him, our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about. But Punky stops just on the porch. She watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings were still down the hall, and I run to check on them. When I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still, but the bedroom window was wide open. The curtains pushed all to one side, and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch, where Punky was sleeping. So I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off. And the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside, while our small dogs were the ones that saw a public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took us all to my aunt's house, and on our way there, we saw the men walking up someone else's drive. Men being plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. Long story short, I'm a waitress at a restaurant, and one night, I left my job finishing my shift at about 1am. Weekends we do karaoke, so we get out later than usual. When I got home, I realized somebody had hit my car while it was parked, which was pretty bad, but I still was able to drive it. So I just went to bed and went to work the next day, still stressed about having to fix it. A normal guy who goes to the restaurant often, we consider him a regular, noticed my car was hit the next day. He asked me if I had found someone to fix it yet. I said no. He offered to fix it at a reasonable price. I didn't think anything about it, as he's always been a fairly kind customer at the restaurant, and never been creepy in any way. I told him I'd contact him when I was financially able to have him fix the car, and he said that was totally fine. Well, the other day I called him up and let him know I could pay him to fix my car this week. I asked if he'd be able to come pick my car up while I worked. He had let me know before he had a car I could use while he fixed mine so I asked him if he'd be able to drop off the car I can borrow while he works on mine, and he just drives mine to his shop. But he's refusing and insists I drive out with him to his shop at the end of my shift, which was around 10pm. I immediately got a weird feeling and told him no. The only way I'll let him work on my car is if he drops off his car for me to use, and he takes mine. I told him I will not be driving anywhere with him, especially not that late. He keeps insisting and it's creeping me out. I don't know if I'm just overreacting, or it is something genuinely weird that should be looked into. He's never been that creepy before, but the fact he refuses to take my car unless I go, late at night instead of during the day, like the morning before I work, is unsettling to me. I'd been dealing with harassment from a guy friend of mine, and I ended up snapping. It happened about a month ago on Friday. 
I was leaving school and was in the parking lot when he ran up to me and yelled, Hey tits. His friend started laughing and making rude gestures, so I fucking shoved him. He wasn't expecting it and he fell to the ground, where he promptly got pissed out of his mind. I don't know how to describe it, but he got a dangerous look in his eye. You know when a man's too angry to say anything and looks calm, but his eyes are filled with hatred. It was chilling. His friends laughing at him on the ground. His fury that was just so silent. Then, it was like a switch flipped. His eyes went dead. I don't know how else to describe it. You know when you see a dead fish at a supermarket? It was like that. He stood up, brushed himself off, and backed me against the car. Before I could say anything, he leaned down and whispered, You're going to regret that. You're going to slip up one day, and I'll be there, and I'll teach your stupid horse self a lesson you won't forget. I work overnights as a janitor at an old abandoned gym that's being converted into a construction office and storage unit. So this night I was working, and about 20 minutes or so into my shift, I hear a loud bang sound. It startles me a bit, and I think nothing of it since it's storming really bad outside. I hear it again, and breaking glass accompany it at the same time, so I follow the noise and hear more loud banging and screaming. I get closer, and I'm led to a window in the back of the building. I look outside and see someone outside the window. The windows themselves are triple-layered glass and one-way mirrors as well. He continues to hit the glass with a chunk of concrete, and the glass starts chipping away into little square pieces. He screams some more, then manages to get through the first layer of glass. This person gets pissed off when he realizes there's more glass. I tell him to stop and leave or I'm calling the cops. Then he starts threatening me, saying something along the lines of, I'll bite your kneecaps off. So I finally get the cops on the phone and tell them what's going on. I wait by the window with a big ass wrench in my hands, ready to swing if he manages to get inside. Not even a few minutes later, the cops finally show up and have their guns pointed at him. They get him cuffed and he tells him some wild ass story saying that he owns the place and has lost his keys. I'm not sure if this was weird, but it's the second time it happened to me while I was parked. I was sitting on the phone, my car was off, and then a lady taps on my window. I start my car, drop the window down slightly, and ask what's up. She tells me she's homeless and asks if I have a cigarette. I say sorry, I don't smoke. I offered her the leftover pizza I had, and she was very grateful. I asked if she wanted any other food, and she says McDonald's. So I told her to wait, and I'll go get the Big Mac meal she asked for. I went, and I was in line. I see her put the pizza on the ground, and she talks on the phone while I'm standing in line, staring at me and then I see her run into the Tim Hortons. Once I got the food, I parked where she dropped the pizza and waited a bit. I thought maybe she was going to go to the bathroom. Ten minutes later, a car parks next to me. It was a guy. He was just glancing at me, but didn't get out of his car. He stayed there and started talking to the guy in the car next to him. It just felt weird, so I drove away. I noticed the guy parked next to me drove away at the same time. Three turns later and he's still behind me. Eventually he turns left and I kept going straight, so it could have all been in my head. But why did she leave before I gave her her food? And why did she leave the pizza? I was so confused. FYI, I'm a woman in my mid-twenties. My friends think it could be sex trafficking, but I don't know. Our area is pretty safe. My parents introduced me to a murderer. Well, a man capable of murder. 
and we didn't know just yet. He was a down-to-earth stoner, with three kids and another on the way, with a super sweet wife who was also a little crazy. He came over, would tell my parents everything going on in his life, and then disappear for a few days. We always came back with some crazy stories, but we would never assume anything bad about him. He'd tell us how his wife stabbed him in the foot, how the kids dug a hole in their trailer, that his mother-in-law was a psycho, and once he did come over, on the run for having a gun at his mother-in-law's, he was there and gone in five minutes. I regularly check our state circuit court. He was never in legal trouble when I looked him up so I just assumed he had family issues and maybe a couple screws loose. Last time I saw him, he came over, smoked with my mom and my girl, told us how excited he was for the baby on the way, and hoped he looked more like him than the last one, who was basically a clone of his mama. We all hung out together outside and drove the kids around in the ATV, bullshitting about our pasts and our futures. He was hopeful, not a bone in his body said, aggressive. He was very empathetic, very family-oriented, and just kind. And then he went missing for two weeks, not a peep from him or his wife. We then saw his picture in the news with the title, Murderer Takes His Own Life, with his name attached to it. He apparently killed a man, took his body and dumped it. When the police tried talking to him while he was in his car, he turned, looked at the police, and shot himself. I'm so confused and I will never even hear the full story. Two dead men. No closure for anyone. I'll forever wonder who else I know is capable of murder. So today... I was waiting for a friend to finish her lesson so we could go to the store together. While I was waiting, I sat alone and studied when this girl that I'd never seen before came up and asked if she could sit down at my table. I said of course and continued to study, but it was very obvious that she wanted to make conversation and didn't pick up on my signals saying that I was busy. So I gave up on my studies and talked to her for a bit. It was extremely awkward. She was bragging about random shit. Overall, just a bad experience. My friend comes out of class, so we're talking about leaving. The random girl tries to get us to stay or tag along, but I desperately wanted to get out of the situation. So we start leaving when she says, Can I have your Snapchat, Wyatt? I make up a lie that I don't have one for reasons, and I give her a different social media account, which is very inactive. Only after did I realize I 100% never mentioned my name to her. My friend also thought it was very strange, and he picked up on the obvious awkwardness. Neither of us had ever seen her at school before, which is strange considering it's a very small school. It's an everyone knows everyone kind of deal. She was about my age, but I'm sure I don't know her. I'm creeped out. Why did this happen? Who is she? It was about 4.45 in the afternoon. My aunt was home alone since my parents were at work and I was on my way home. She heard a knock at the door and went to answer it when the dogs continued barking, meaning it wasn't a quick delivery or something. She was met with three young adult men. They were all wearing black, matching uniforms. Though we don't actually know if they were uniforms or not, they came in a white van with blue letters on it. English isn't her first language, so it was hard for her to understand what they were saying, because they talked too fast for her. But she understood when they asked for me by name. Is Chloe home? She told them that I wasn't, and they left immediately. They didn't leave a message for me, or a note, or a business card, or anything. When I got home shortly after, she told me that some people had been looking for me. They weren't family, obviously, or she would have known and they weren't friends of mine. They don't sound like any religious group I've heard of before. They didn't go to our neighbor's houses. They came to our home specifically, and they knew me by my first name. I'm worried about them coming back again. 
My aunt doesn't live with us, and usually I would be the one home alone at that hour. I'm curious as to who they were and what they wanted with me, but I'm also scared to think how it would have gone if I had opened the door instead. One rather slow morning, it was just my boss and I working. He was in the back office doing manager work stuff, so it looked like I was the only one in the store. This guy comes in asking about our phone plans. As I'm going through the sale, he kept getting increasingly nervous. By the time I checked him out with his new phone, he was weirdly giggle smiling and fidgeting. I thought he might be gearing up to ask me out. As a socially awkward individual, I expedited the checkout process and quickly excused myself to the back office to hide it out. I'm sure anyone in customer service can relate to not wanting to awkwardly turn down people who hit on you at your workplace. He left. My day went on as normal. Then the phone call started. I answered the phone. Hi, how may I help you? All I was met with was breathing. Hello? My mind goes to the awkward guy early this morning, but I try not to jump to conclusions. Maybe it's a prank call. About an hour later, it happens again. I hang up immediately and tell my manager, who offers to answer the phones. About an hour later, my manager comes out and says someone's calling with a question, and they worked with me. Normal stuff. I answer, hello? I was met with more breathing. I motion to my manager, handing the phone back. He puts the phone to his ear, hears this creep and just yells, what the hell, don't call back here. The next few days, my store starts getting phone calls asking for me, everyone responding with, I'm not working, and they can't say when I'll be back. I start getting walked to my car after every shift. Then, on day three, after a morning of multiple calls, this guy just shows up. Just one male co-worker and I working all day. He walks in with a to-go bag of food, and he starts perusing the headphones displayed on the wall. I motion to my co-worker, this is the guy. The hero co-worker jumps up and helps the guy. Hey man, what's going on? This guy was no longer a normal awkward guy from a few days ago. He was calm, eyes opened way too wide, creepily smiling at my co-worker, not paying attention to me. How much for the headphones? My co-worker starts awkwardly keeping up his customer service, asking about which ones he may want. This guy just stands there saying nothing. A solid 20 seconds of not answering his questions, just a creepy stare. Then he turns without a word and walks out, the entire time not looking at me. Once he leaves, my coworker tells me to go to the back and call our manager. I'm spooked. My manager says if he comes back, tell him he's banned from the store. Not even an hour passed and he's back, the to-go food still in his hand. This time the store is busy. I quickly explain to the customer I'm working with what's going on and I run to the back office. We have store cameras displayed on a monitor, which I'm now glued to. I see my coworker go up to him and talk to him. He just backs out of the door. This guy literally walks backwards 10 feet, never taking his eyes off my coworker, smiling the whole time. My coworker comes back and tells me to call the non-emergency police number. The police catch him sitting outside with his doggy to-go box. My coworker and I are peeking out the window from behind the phone case display. A young police officer comes in and explains the guy said I asked him to buy me lunch and that we were dating. I informed him that I sold him a phone three days ago. He's been harassing me since by calling the store multiple times. My coworker backs me up, telling him about the creepy breathing. A while later, two police officers come back in to let us know he's been banned from the store. The older police officer says to call back immediately if he comes back. This guy's on probation for doing this to other girls. 
The rest of the day goes by, and a co-worker and I are on high alert. Close to the end of the day, we've settled down, sitting at a table shooting the shit when he goes. Don't look behind you. He's back. Just walk into the back room. This guy's standing in the window, looking into the store. Just standing there. We called the police, but he left way before they arrived. A police car parked outside of the store for the rest of the shift. I never saw that creepy stalker again. I don't think his motive was to actually date me. I think he just got off on scaring girls. None of his actions were normal by any means. This happened back in December 2018. I worked as a CNA at a place about 40 minutes away from me, and my shift ends at 11pm. This night, I stopped at a gas station only about 6 minutes away from my house to fill up my tank. While my gas was pumping, a big van pulls up and decides to park at the pump in front of me, instead of the tons of empty ones. One man hops out of the passenger side, opens the trunk doors, and starts to head towards me. Now at this gas station, pallets of salt bags were placed in between the pumps outside. In my head, I thought he was going towards the pallet due to the crazy snow we were having. Instead, he walks past the pallet right up to my car. Once he reaches my car, my first instinct told me to pull out my pepper spray and say, If you take one more step, I'm gonna fucking blind you. He turns around immediately, shuts the trunk doors, and hops in the passenger seat again. The van peels off and, well, that was that. So for a bit of backstory, I had just finished high school and had recently turned 18 when all of this occurred. I was looking forward to starting university and was going to be moving out of my parents' house into student housing closer to the campus. As a result, I started looking for a job closer to my residence. I found one about a five minute walk from where I was going to be living, and it was perfect for me. I was to be a barista in a tiny little coffee kiosk on one of the coolest streets in the city. This street was sort of known for prostitution and drugs, but it was also really popular as it hosted some of the most interesting events and also contained some of the nicest thrift stores in the city. What was even more ideal about my new job was the fact that I worked right across the road from my best friend, Phoebe. At the time Phoebe was in love with her job, she was actively being given more responsibilities and she was being promised the world by her employers. During one of her shifts, Phoebe was approached by a man who would seemingly become a regular at the place she was working. His name was Richard. He told her that if she ever wanted to leave her job, he had just become the manager of a new restaurant a little ways down the road. Phoebe kindly declined his offer. He approached her several more times with the same offer before she recommended him our other close friend, Mia. Mia was hesitant to take the position at first because she has a passionate hatred for hospitality and greatly prefers retail, but she needed the extra money at the time and, well, she took the job. The day that Mia was signing her contract, Phoebe and I both finished work early, at about 4, so we told Mia that we would meet her at a new job once we finished, and then we would go do something after. Phoebe and I went to the cake shop next door and sat outside her work while we waited for Mia. When they finished, Richard followed Mia outside to come say hi to Phoebe. The girls introduced him to me and our conversation ensued. He seemed like a friendly guy, if not a bit awkward. He was late thirties to early forties, bird-like in appearance, quite short, balding, and larger in size, and he seemed very greasy. As the conversation continued, I began to tease Mia a bit, as friends do. I saw no harm in it, as she was one of my best friends, and she had made a similar joke at my expense prior to this interaction. Richard's demeanor suddenly seemed to switch. He became somewhat catty in defense of Mia. He retorted back that if I was going to be mean to his staff, then he would bar me from every store on the street we worked on. This seemed ridiculous, 
but he claimed to be friends with the security guard that worked on the street. I actually was friends with this man, and when I asked him about it, he told me he'd never heard of Richard before. Richard said these things to me as though he was joking, but he was so persistent about it that I got incredibly uncomfortable and wanted to cry. It was from this interaction that he nicknamed me Trouble. I also feel it needs to be noted that he didn't scold me or Phoebe at all for the same behavior. Phoebe sensed my discomfort and told him that we needed to leave as we had plans. Flash forward a few weeks and Phoebe and I decided to go see Mia at work again. Richard intrudes on our conversation yet again, and again he singles me out from the group, teasing me and only referring to me as trouble. This time I just play along as I can tell it isn't going to stop. He asks Mia if she's after another job as he needs someone to clean his home and lives all the way out where my parents and Mia live. Mia tells him she can't as she has too many responsibilities, but I tell him I might know a few people in the area that might do it, and I give him my phone number. Richard takes this as a sign that I agreed to do it, and begins texting me incessantly about setting up a meeting. This man is much older than me, and lives alone in a rural area. Suddenly my instincts kick in, and I try to get out of it by telling him I can't drive. He says he can pick me up from the nearest train station. I don't want to come across as impolite or have my best friend's boss resent her because of me, so I make the mistake of agreeing. However, I tell him that my sister will be helping me as she's looking for a part-time job and my dad will be dropping me off. I do this in order to have some backup so that my dad knows my whereabouts. Richard goes on to complain about how I don't trust him and claims that his house is very small and the $100 he's going to pay me won't be enough to split with my sister. I tell him that I just want to provide her with work experience, and finally he agrees, asking how old she is. I told him my sister's 17. Richard and I finally find a time that I'm not working to schedule a meeting. This meeting is held at his place of work, and I feel a lot more comfortable sitting in the main restaurant, surrounded by people, as I thought he was going to hold the meeting in an office. We began talking about the responsibilities of the job. He tells me it'll be basic things like tidying up, vacuuming, the usual. I agree. He then goes on to tell me he will also be expecting me to do his laundry. I think this is a bit odd as he's only paying a small amount for such a large job. He assures me his house is small and not that messy but continuously claims it just needs a woman's touch. I nod and ignore the fact that this man thinks that, well, just because he is a man, it means he doesn't need to know how to maintain his own home. Now this is where things start to get creepy. Near the end of the meeting, he asks me again how old my sister is, and when I say 17, his face drops. He then starts telling me about how he previously posted the ad on Craigslist, and this 60-year-old woman replied, offering to do it in her lingerie. He tells me how he didn't even ask for that in the ad, but she offered and he was put off completely. He then proceeds to tell me that he would be willing to pay more to someone between the ages of 18 to 30 if they were willing to do that, but that he would never request that because he's not a pervert. I call bullshit. I tell him then and there that the meeting is done. I have to go meet Phoebe. He asks me if he made me uncomfortable. A fucking course he did, but I just say no and I'll get back to him. This strange man, who I've only met three times, then attempts to hug me, but I ignore the gesture and awkwardly wave goodbye from less than three feet away. I boost it down the street to Phoebe's work and I tell her the whole story. She tells me I can't do it, and I tell her I know, but I don't know how to tell him that without risking my own safety or Mia's job. Fortunately, Richard gives me the perfect out. He texts me later that afternoon, telling me he hopes I'm okay with cats because he has a small one. I see this as the perfect opportunity and lie to him. I tell him my sister and I are both deathly allergic to cats, and neither of us will be open to doing the job. Richard accepts this reasoning after a little persuasion, and I think I'm finally done with him. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Richard proceeded to text me every day, asking if I'm mad at him 
or if he made me uncomfortable, asking me how my day was and that kind of thing, just behaving like a teen in a new relationship basically. And the more I ignored him, the more he messaged. I finally blocked him in March of 2019. This escapade had begun four or five months prior to this. The blocking still didn't stop him though. Mia informed me that Richard was no longer going to be working there as he had to go for surgery and we wouldn't have to see him anymore. See, Richard hadn't only been harassing me, but Mia and Phoebe too, just to a lesser extent. One Saturday morning while I was working, setting up around 7.45am, Richard showed up at my work. The divider was down as we were closed, so he came and stood in the doorway, the only exit I had available to me at the time. He started asking me why I was ignoring him, telling me about his surgery. I told him he wasn't allowed to stand there as it was a fire exit, but he didn't budge. Fortunately, my boss showed up shortly after and told Richard he was going to phone security if he didn't move, also recognizing the sheer look of fear on my face. My boss was kind of an ass on most days, but holy shit was I grateful for him that morning. Roughly a month after that experience, I thought Richard was gone from my life. I was living in a new apartment. Mia was around all the time and loved her job without Richard there. Things were going well for us. One morning after a night of drinking, me and the flatmates became peckish. I decided to order us some greasy food on a food delivery app. Lo and behold, who is our delivery driver other than Richard? I turn to my boyfriend at the time and tell him he has to go collect the food. He doesn't understand, but Mia assures him it's important. He agrees and goes out to collect it. Richard is not driving the vehicle he claims to be driving on the app, and at first we're confused, as the number plate is also different. Mia and I watch from his bedroom window and the interaction takes much longer than expected. My boyfriend comes back and we ask him what took so long. He tells us that Richard refused to give him the food until he could prove that he was my boyfriend. He recognized my name from the app, and now he knew where we lived. Me and I tell my flatmates the whole story of what happened, and we all agree it's a good idea to go to the RA. The RA reports it to the upper management, and they say they really can't do anything about it, but if he comes in again to call their security. A few months go by and there's no Richard sightings, until I order from the same app again. Yet again, Richard is our driver, and also in a different car to what it says on the app. I send my boyfriend to go collect the food again, and also report the incident to my RA again, and the food delivery app. I know I was stupid and not immediately reporting it to campus security as I had much more proof of the creepy behavior than he had of his innocence. But I was naive and I didn't want my parents to find out at the time. Fortunately, I haven't seen Richard since then. Okay. I've never said this about myself because I don't have a huge ego, but I think the co-worker who is stalking me is actually jealous of me. He and his ex-girlfriend have been looking me up on social media, and it's pretty bothersome. I really want to ask why. And by the way, he's currently dating another girl, meaning he's constantly keeping in contact with his ex, and I'm a constant topic of conversation between them. Why do I think he's jealous, I hear you ask? Well... He's the same gen as me, though he's six years older. He's frustrated because we're in the same exact position, though I'm much younger. I got into the master's program he got rejected for at the same school. I recently got a new job and I'm leaving soon, but my new job is exactly what he's been trying to get. He told me almost immediately after I started two years ago that he was applying to jobs. Yes, he's been applying for almost two years and hasn't been accepted anywhere. And also, my boss has been giving me more work and giving him less. Over time, it's been reduced to him doing almost nothing. I know all this because we share a computer at work, but we work different shifts. His browser search history is filled with him looking up my social media, leaves all his personal emails up and everything like that. 
he's been relaying any information he finds out about me to his ex via email. Yes, I've looked through his emails because he leaves them up. Why? Well, because ever since I started, he's been extremely condescending, rude, and try to get me fired, and almost succeeded by purposely telling me the wrong steps on a procedure that ended up costing us money. I say purposely because it's a task he's been doing for more than a year, until I was hired. When I first started, I would always see his emails open, but never found any desire to look through them, simply because it wasn't my business. However, after I accidentally left my personal email up, I found him deeply looking through my email, and he even made a snide remark about it to me, condescendingly saying, Just a tip, you shouldn't leave your personal info on a company computer. Funny, I know. I understand it's morally wrong, and I don't fight fire with fire, but I really don't understand this guy's problem, especially because he's constantly talking down about me to my co-workers, and his ex-girlfriend, and maybe even his current girlfriend. He's weird and I don't know what to do about it. I'm a 21-year-old girl that works at a home improvement store. My co-worker, who also happens to be my team lead, is a mother of two children and married. We were in the self-checkout area. She was fixing one of the registers. The register she was working on put her with her back facing towards the customers. Nothing weird happened at first, and I was doing my normal rounds. Then this old guy comes up to the register I had just cleaned, so I greeted him and he did the same. The guy must have been in his 50s. He starts scanning his stuff, and I noticed one of his items has a security tag, so I went to go grab a magnet. As I'm walking towards him, I casually mention that I have to take the tag off and he doesn't really say anything, but just nods. I start striking up a conversation with him. The guy is answering, but he's not staring directly at me. His eyes are fixed behind me. I thought the guy was just zoning out. When he sees that I noticed, he quickly looks at me and continues the conversation, but it's pretty obvious that he's forcing it. Anyway, I took the magnet off and went to return it. I came back around to do my rounds when I noticed the same guy was still there, and he had changed the way he was facing. He was folding his receipt, but I could see his eyes were staring at something in front. It didn't hit me at first until I turned to see what he was looking at. He was staring at my team lead. Well, more specifically, a certain part of her. She had bent down to lock up the register. I felt my stomach drop and the sudden urge to throw up. I turned back to the guy and noticed he had pulled his phone out. Before he had the chance to do anything, I walked up to him and asked if he still needed help with anything. In a low voice, he says, Yeah, can you help me get a piece of that beauty over there? Without thinking much, I said, I'm sure her husband thinks she's beautiful as well. After that, he just stares blankly at me and then says, He doesn't have to know, with this predatory look in his eyes. By this point, I'm not even disgusted anymore, just livid. In a loud voice, I say to him, Thank you for shopping with us. Have a great day. At that sudden raise of my voice, a few people turned around, and that was enough for him to take off in a hurry. My team lead hugged and thanked me after I told her what happened. So yeah, creepy self-checkout guy, I hope we never see you again. This scares me a lot more now than it did when it happened. Thirteen-ish years ago, in my late teens, I moved from a small rural area to the outskirts of Chicago. I hadn't been living there long when I got a job at a record store. This place was pretty famous. Hell, when my husband went to Germany, he mentioned to someone where I worked and he said, She works there. Which one is she? I felt pretty lucky to work there and was able to pretty easily shrug off the multiple creeps who always hounded the cashiers. I also felt safe because during the night shifts, there was almost always a local cop doing security, and I made fast friends with most of them. 
We had very strict policies, and it was fortunately not even close to a customer is always right kind of place. People would get really upset over our credit card and return policies, but we were pretty much able to do everything just shy of directly telling them to fuck off, and our managers would back us up. One day, a cop came in, asking to return a CD. I asked to look at the item, as usual, and it was open. I always found it best to operate under the assumption that they were familiar with the return policy and deal with any outrage as it came up. So I said, sure, just grab the same one and we'll swap it out for you. Of course he got mad. But I don't want the same one. I want a different one, he said. I'm sorry, sir. The return policy is that an item can be exchanged for something else or store credit if it's still sealed. If it's open." We can only exchange it for the same item, I explained to him. Well, I didn't know that, he replied. I'm sorry, the return policy is clearly written on the back of your receipt. He started getting really angry. He put his hands on the counter and leaned over it, getting as close to me as he could. Well, what if I pulled you over on your way home from work? I didn't think I'd heard him correctly. What? I asked. I could wait until you leave and pull you over, he said. I was incredulous, but unperturbed. Uh, that's cool. I don't drive. Well, I could pull over whoever is taking you home. Seriously. Okay, cool. I'm walking home, I responded. Tell me where you live. Give me your license. I don't have a license, that's why I'm walking, I said to him. You're gonna walk home, alone, he questioned. Okay, I was starting to feel unsettled. Look, I'll call the manager, she's just gonna tell you the same thing. I can't change the return policy for you just because you're a cop. He left, angrily, before I could page my manager. At the time, I was pretty cavalier about the whole thing. In my mind, he couldn't do anything to me if I didn't do anything wrong. It never occurred to me that a police officer could ever lie for their own gain. But I was still looking over my shoulder for the next few weeks when I would walk home. I casually mentioned it to one of the officers working security later that week. I'd never, ever seen him get so angry. He made me promise that if I ever saw him again, I would get his badge number and he gave me his phone number in case I needed anything. I didn't really realize how messed up the whole thing was until then. It still freaks me out now to think that a police officer threatened me over a $15 CD. So I recently visited a family out of state. We've all been really careful about the pandemic stuff and only met as we believed an elderly family member was in her last days. She pulled through though. While visiting, my aunt decided to have a mini kickback at her co-worker's place. I was reluctant to go, but she assured us that he would only be there to let us in and that she would sanitize things before we all came over. Fine, I guess. We get there and the space where we get together was some kind of split-level terrace situation attached to the back of the house. It was pretty cool as he had color-changing lights all around and a kick-ass Native American mural painted on the windows, so you couldn't see in or out to the backyard. There was also a full bar in one area to the side, large enough to serve as an actual establishment. The kickback begins, and while my aunts and uncles start dancing and drinking, I start to explore the room. I wander over to the side of the bar where there's a bookshelf. I love to read and I love books, so it drew me in. As I'm checking out the books on the shelf, I notice some pictures on the bottom shelf. My vision went totally out of focus. For the first time in my life, I truly could not believe my eyes. At the bottom of the bookshelf was a framed picture of me from my high school homecoming dance. I was 15 at the time that picture was taken. I wasn't really sure how to manage the panic I was feeling, so I just decided to go to the other side of the room and wait for the party to end. 
I've never met this man in my life. I hadn't even seen him when we were in his house. I don't have a clue where he got the picture, or why he chose to keep it framed in his bar room. I don't think anyone else noticed, and I was far too mortified to say anything. I can't even let myself think what possessed him to print my picture and frame it. I just know that under no circumstances will I ever enter that house again. So I have this co-worker who was pretty much like a father to me. He used to be protective and supportive. Now that we're in quarantine, we're all doing home office, and the things started getting a bit weird. First, I forgot to mention that he had a temporary incapacity leave due to a minor surgery, and he was on meds daily. One day, out of the blue, he sent me a WhatsApp message that said something like this. Hey, it's 1pm and I'm just waking up. I'm acting like you now, lol. I had a lucid dream and you appeared there. I just want to note, he's married and has one kid, and he's double my age. I decide to ignore it because I didn't consider it relevant, and even though I left him on scene, a couple of hours later, he started asking the color of the paint on my walls. I just replied with the color and let it go. We never spoke about it again, because we were discussing another topic which was more important than that job stress. I was working four or five hours extra daily because I was doing my own tasks and also his tasks, so it was a lot on me. Two days later, we were on the phone talking about it, and he was calming me because I was starting to have a lot of anxiety attacks due to the huge amount of work I was taking on on a daily basis. And just before I was about to hang up, he said, Wait, I never told you about the dream I had. I was so mentally tired that I just listened to whatever he was saying. He said this with a happy tone. I could feel he was smiling. As I told you before, I had a lucid dream, and I was in your bedroom last night, and it felt so real. We started to make love in different positions, and it was pretty intense, and I did it like I never did it before. We started to make a lot of noises with your bed, and then your father started to knock on your door, angrily asking you what was going on. But before he entered your room, I hid under your bed, and he didn't see me, so he left. I couldn't believe what I had just heard, so I just hung up the call. I sent him a text saying that I was pretty angry and disgusted to what I had just heard, and he replied with, I'm sorry, I'll tell my mind to stop those thoughts. I still can't believe he said that, and I feel really disappointed because he was like a father to me. Now I see all of his actions in the past led up to this point. I have no words to explain the disgust I feel, but I needed to get it off my chest. I also want to drop in that HR is doing nothing. I am so angry. Back in the 90s, my friend and I had been out one night to judge a pageant. On the way home, we decided to stop by a liquor store and get something to drink when we got back to her house. We had babysitters, so it was like a mom break. Well, she couldn't wait and added some to a slushy, so we decided to take the back roads home. I was not drinking. It was a very rural area. Houses were miles apart and there was a lot of farmland, but it was an area she grew up around and was familiar with it. My car at the time was literally two to three months old. I never had an issue with it. As we're going down a certain road, the feeling was just eerie, pitch black. Something was off and we talked about it at the time. I asked her if she was sure that this was the right way. She assures me it is, so I turn the music back up and off we go. Then I get a feeling again, but this time I tell her I don't like it and we should turn around. So we were looking for a place to turn around and could see a bridge up ahead. She said people fish beside it, and there's a place I can turn around just over there. As soon as she says that, my car shuts completely off. Lights, music, everything. You could not see anything. I'm trying to restart it. I can't even get a sound from the engine. This goes on for three to five minutes. We were freaking out. 
There was no cell phone service either. Back then you never had flashlights on your cell phone, so it was complete darkness. And as soon as it stopped, it came back on. When it did, the headlights came on and we could see beer cans lined up in the middle of the road in front of us. They were not there before. We were confused. I threw the car in reverse and drove backwards until I could turn around. We were both scared, asking how it happened. How did those cans get there? We could not come up with anything. The next day I took my car to the dealership and told them about it shutting down. They ran a test on it and couldn't find anything wrong. A few days later she called me and asked if I saw the paper yet. I said no. She told me to go get it. I look at the picture on the front page and that's where we were at. I rushed to get the newspaper. The night my car died at the bridge, a man had been out drinking with his friends and somehow it came out this man was having an affair with one of his friend's wives. They had parked where people went fishing down under the bridge and the man having an affair was beaten to death. At some point the man got away and made it up to the bridge and then the other man shot him and threw him over the bridge into the water. The next day a fisherman found the body. The man confessed, adding a car was coming and parked by the bridge, and during that time is when he escaped, and he was fighting to keep him on the bank. If the man would have made it up, more than likely we would have been shot as well. I never figured out why my car shut down. I like to think divine intervention. I could never figure out how the beer cans appeared either. Needless to say, I would not use that road for years, and if I do, it has to be daylight. This happened to my now husband and I years ago. At the time we were dating, and this happened when I was staying the night at his house. It was around midnight, and someone knocked on the door. He cracked the door open, and there was a youngish guy who pleaded for us to let him in. He said he had no shoes on and he was going to freeze to death, and he really needed to come inside. For context, it was winter and raining, and we could see he was really barefoot. He had no other explanation for what happened or what he wanted from us. He wasn't asking for a ride or to use the phone. He just insisted he needed to come inside. My husband said, I'm sorry, but I'm not comfortable with you coming in here. Try one of my neighbors. The guy refused to leave and kept insisting. After a minute of back and forth, the guy yelled out, If you don't let me in, you're going to kill me. I was getting uncomfortable and said, Okay, I'm getting the dog. His dad had a German shepherd that was really vicious. The guy heard me and finally left. He ran off down the whole street. Didn't stop at anyone else's house. I always wondered what his deal was and why he singled us out. What would have happened if we let him inside, or if he fought his way inside? The whole situation was off and felt creepy. I'm a male and I was 12 at the time. Quite a few years ago, I was walking home from a trip to my local downtown with my friend. We noticed a 1990s black sedan moving behind us. We thought nothing of it, because number one, we were literally across the street from the police station, and number two, we were only a block away from my house. A few seconds pass when the driver pulls to the side of the road adjacent to me and my friend, and he rolls down the window. He hesitated for a moment, and then asked if we'd seen his cat around. He was describing a grey cat with green eyes. Since I hadn't, I replied no. He then states that he was hard of hearing and beckoned us toward his car, explaining it was to hear us better. My stranger danger senses shot up instantly, as my mother had just warned me about this days prior. My friend, being much younger, started to approach him. Luckily I grabbed his arm just in time, and quietly told him to stay behind me, since I was older. I told him that we would keep an eye out for it, and to have a good day. But he again asked for us to approach his car, so he could hear us. At this point I was starting to panic, so I quickly waved goodbye and walked towards my house. This is where it gets bad. 
We continue walking home, crossing the final crosswalk before my block. So I turn my head because I didn't see him pass us. Lo and behold, he's crawling along the road, trying to match our pace with his vehicle. He began trying to get us to stop. At this point, my heart is racing. I was even more scared because I was responsible for my friend. We began running because this was truly terrifying. We didn't run long as I'm an asthmatic and my friend was plus sized, so the man didn't struggle to stay hot on our trail. After what felt like an eternity, we stepped onto my driveway. But oh no, he was not done yet. He began to pull into my driveway. Before we had a chance to react, he got into park and was opening his door. Luckily, my mom was able to see this, as she was in the kitchen at the time, which had a direct view of our driveway, so she hurried out to meet us in the driveway and escorted us into the house. My mom came back to talk with him, but he panicked and drove off as fast as he could. Thank God my mom was there, because we might not have made it to the door before he snatched us. So for some quick backstory, around July or August of 2021, my city was under its second major lockdown, where you were not allowed to have any guests over at your house. I had just moved back into my parents in early July after my lease ended, and I didn't renew it. My mother was a big stickler for the pandemic laws, so my girlfriend was not even allowed on my big front porch. Yeah, it was really annoying. Now on to the story. My girlfriend and I would often go for walks around the local creek near my house, and we were a fresh couple, so we had needs, if you understand. There was a hidden side path attached to the main walkway that goes through the creek we would sneak off into, so we could relieve ourselves. One night at about 7pm, we decided to walk to our spot, and my girlfriend was excited and decided to skip ahead of me. I was walking slowly, while she was about 7 meters ahead of me. Once I turned the corner into the side area, I noticed she was on her phone and she was acting suspiciously, checking the weather and other apps. She randomly said, Okay, it's time for me to go home. I was just sort of like, Uh, okay. She doesn't want to do anything anymore. No worries. As we started walking away, she whispers, There's someone right behind you. I turned my head over my right shoulder, and there was a man all in black with his hoodie on, squatting and hiding in the bushes, staring at us. Where the bush was located was on top of a ledge about three to four feet above the path, so while the man in black was squatting or crouching, our faces were basically aligned. I immediately said, what the fuck, and this man did not react at all. He didn't gasp, say hello or excuse me or any of the usual things a person would say if people noticed each other in the pitch black woods. He just stared at us as we walked away. I asked my girlfriend how she even noticed him, and she said when she walked down the trail before I got there, she saw the man on his phone, and as soon as she arrived, the man in the hoodie turned his phone off. We left that walkway and went up sort of a close by one, and as we were walking up the parallel side trail, we could still see the man hiding in the bushes, staring at us. While not really scary, it was more of a creepy, unexplained event. I'm a female, and at 16 to 17, I used to have terrible insomnia, so to pass the time I would go for walks around my neighborhood really early in the morning. It was one of those mornings, and I was out for a walk when I heard a car approaching me. Mind you, I live in a nicer, middle-class neighborhood that's a bit more secluded, and people don't usually drive through there at night. This was a bit concerning. I turn around, and there's a big white van driving really slow, around 20 feet behind me. Instead of continuing my walk, I stopped and waited to see what they were up to. It seems kind of stupid but there's no way I'm turning my back on a vehicle at 2am just to get snatched and killed. The van then stops and two dark figures get out and start walking toward me. 
In my head, I say, oh shit, and I start to run. It might have been an overreaction, but I had this terrible feeling in my gut. I run towards my house, hiding behind bushes. I don't see the van until I turn the corner. They park near a patch of houses, and five of them were out of the van, with flashlights looking around for something. They all had dark clothing on and weren't saying a word. One of the house's porch lights turned on, and they run back to their van and hightail it out of there. It was pretty weird, and maybe I overreacted, but I don't know. You tell me. I work in retail and there are only five of us that work in the store, including our manager. We are a very, very tight-knit family, so naturally we have each other's backs for anything and everything. Tonight, my coworker and I were minding the store, and he needed to leave early for a dinner reservation with some friends that just got into town. So I covered the last 30 minutes alone. We work in an area that has a prominent homeless population, most of whom are wonderful people. After he left, within minutes, a very sketchy character came in that set my hair on end. This guy was about six and a half feet tall, heavier set, and was generally intimidating. To add to the already scary vibe, he was holding a big gulp and a golf club, nothing else on his person. He did not hesitate to make conversation, and it's my job to be friendly and make sales, so I jumped in hoping I'd learn he was harmless and coming back from a driving range. There are no golf courses within 20 miles of my workplace. I was so terribly wrong. This man had his hospital bracelet on from his two-month-long stay in a mental hospital and was very, very interested in me and every aspect of my life. He asked what I was studying and I told him psychiatry. He was immediately put off as he had had a bad experience. My heart goes out to people in his portion who are clearly struggling and it's my life mission to help people like him. But no matter how much my heart goes out to him, I was still very vulnerable. He asked me the following questions. What is your name? Where do you live? Where do you go to school? When do you work? How often do you work? When is your next break? How old are you? Do you live alone? Is anyone else here? I lied to every single question, and when he demanded my phone number, I gave him the store phone number. I also told him my name was my manager's name, so if he needed to make contact, he would be directed to someone that's not me. Thankfully, I was able to boot him out at close. When I left, I had changed my clothes and my hair to be less recognizable, and thank God I did that, because he was waiting in the alley out back and somehow did not notice me. Always trust your gut instinct. Three years ago, October in Minnesota, I had just started dating my now wife. I was obsessed with working out and asked her if she would like to use one of my guest passes at the YMCA. She begrudgingly agreed and we started heading to the closest YMCA near her house. We were about a couple of miles away from the gym, with my wife driving south on a busy street, when I noticed on the other side of the road heading north, a woman walking on the sidewalk holding something. Next to her, driving slowly on the shoulder of the road, was an F-350. The hairs on my neck stood up and I shuddered after seeing them. My whole body had goosebumps. I told my wife that she needed to do a U-turn so we could see what was going on. We did the U-turn and got behind the F-350. I noticed immediately that the woman was barefoot and holding a baby wrapped in a blanket. I got out of the car and told my wife to stay in the car and to call the police if anything happened. When I started walking towards the woman, the first thing that I noticed was that she was barefoot. With it being October in Minnesota, the temperature was around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so no one should be walking around without shoes and socks on. When I got close to her, I saw the baby was only wearing a diaper wrapped in a thin blanket. As I got closer, 
I could hear the guy in the truck yelling at this woman to, please get in the truck, get in the truck now. I finally reached the woman and asked her if she was okay and if she needed any help. She said yes and that the guy would not leave her alone. Right then, a different woman started jogging past. I forgot my phone in the car, so I asked if this woman had a cell phone and if she could call the police, which she immediately did. I turn around and face the truck and I can see the man getting out. As he's walking towards us, he's now pleading with the woman to get in the truck with him. I position myself between him and the woman, and he stopped when he was about three feet away from me. I told him he wasn't going to get any closer, and that the police were on their way. Now while the guy stopped walking toward us, he completely ignored me and did not acknowledge what I just said. This is where the story gets a bit weird. The two of them started having a conversation that made zero sense, with me standing between them. Honey. Just get in the truck and come home, he said. You kicked me out and told me to leave, she replied. No, I didn't. I came upstairs and you and the baby were gone. You never let me leave and never let me do anything and never let me spend any of our money, she said to him. We don't have any money. Our credit cards are maxed out. You don't have any shoes on and our baby is cold. Please, let's just go home, he pleaded. I am never coming home with you. You don't let us do anything, ever, she yelled. At this point, two police cars showed up with four cops. One cop spoke with the man, one with the woman, and the other two cops took statements from both me and the jogger. I'm not sure what took place that day with the couple and the baby. I stepped in because I automatically assumed that some sort of abuse was taking place, where the woman was trying to escape from him. Maybe that was happening, or maybe the woman was having a mental breakdown. I will never know. Either way, it was one of the strangest ten minutes of my life. I will start by saying I go to the grocery store a lot at night. I live in an overly populated area. The grocery store is open 24 hours, and sometimes I just like going by myself late in the evening. I don't feel rushed, and no matter what time it is, there are still people there. Not a whole lot, but enough that make you feel safe. I always park on the side of the grocery store. It's just out of habit, because when I do go during the day, it's so packed that the side parking lot is usually the best place to find a spot. One night, I think it was around 9pm, I went to the store. I parked on the side lot. It's right next to the store, and I'm literally 20 feet from the entrance. But the side parking is a lot less populated at night, and there isn't much foot traffic or lighting. But I didn't think much about it. I just headed inside. I was inside for about an hour and came out and loaded my bags. As I was loading them in, I noticed two guys coming from around the back of the building. They started talking to me as they reached the front of my car. I smiled and tried to be as polite as I could while I finished loading up the car. I didn't feel comfortable standing in a semi-dark and empty parking lot talking to two guys, but I also didn't want to be rude or piss them off if I didn't have to. One guy asked for my number and I told him I was in a relationship. He kept pushing it, Tell me he'd take me out somewhere nice. At this point the groceries were in and I moved to get into the driver's seat. I told him again no thanks and just as I was about to shut the door, he grabbed the door frame. Our eyes met. This fear went through me. I'm screaming inside my head to get the hell out of there. He's still talking, more serious now, telling me I'm pretty and he really wants my number. I hold his gaze and say as stern as I can. Let go of my door. We're frozen like that, each of us contemplating our next move. I know one of two things will happen. I can see his mind going through options. There's no one else around. I am thinking of ways to defend myself, knowing if he pushes his way into the car, things are over. I say it again. Let go of my car. Our gazes are still locked, Then his friend mutters something I couldn't hear. He turns around and then looks back at me 
another moment, and then he lets go of my door. I slam it shut and lock it and get the hell out of there. I can feel them watch me pull out. When I talked to some people about it, they all kept saying how lucky I was, how bad it could have been. I sure learned my lesson, I can tell you that. When I was around six, my parents divorced and my dad was soon given full custody, as my mom is an alcoholic and had racked up a few DUIs and such. Anyway, we, being me, my younger sister and my dad, moved to a new neighborhood and we transferred to the nearby elementary school. The school was pretty close to my new house, maybe five or seven or so blocks away, close enough to walk, but my sister and I were too young to walk alone. Sometimes our dad would walk us to school in the morning and then walk back, and less commonly he'd walk to pick us up. Most of the time he picked us up in his black Mazda. The way pickup worked at my school was pretty common. We went out with our class, stood by our teacher and classmates, and when a car pulled up, designated staff members would ask who the student was that they were picking up, and then go find them with their class and escort them to the car. Seeing as my mom was in jail at this time, the only person who ever picked us up was my dad. I was in third grade and my sister in first. One day, we were outside waiting to be picked up. After being outside for only a few minutes, my little sister came over to me and said someone who wasn't dad was in the car to pick us up. They had said both of our names and they'd found her first. She said he'd smiled at her and he told her our dad told him to pick us up that afternoon but she wanted to find me first before she got in the car because she didn't recognize him. Thank God she did that. Our dad has always told us not to talk to strangers, so I grabbed my teacher and told her what happened. She got a really alarmed look at her face and told us to stay where we were while she told another teacher or something. Our dad arrived to pick us up a few minutes later and we got home safely. We told him about it and we all had a long talk about safety protocol. He asked my sister to describe the man and the car. He called the police and gave them the best description he could, although my sister was very young and wasn't very focused on important details like that. A few weeks later it happened again, but this time he said my name. My dad had given the school the same information he'd given to the police, but presumably he had multiple vehicles because my sister said he'd been in a red car and this one was black similar to my dad's. I saw the black car and ran up to it, but luckily I caught a glimpse of the face before I opened the door and hopped in. He was middle-aged, really pale, with a really angular face. We made eye contact and his mouth was smiling, but his eyes looked really wrong to me, squinty and almost angry. I turned back towards the carpool assistant who delivered me to the car. I alerted her to the situation but by the time I did, the car was gone. I couldn't give many details. My dad contacted the police again, but without a license plate, they weren't able to do much. The last time I saw him wasn't till months later, near the end of the school year. I was walking home with a big group of kids that lived in my neighborhood, and he drove by us, slowed the car down, and tried to talk to us. I recognized his face immediately and alerted the kids to run. Luckily, we were only about three houses down from where one of my friends lived, and we all piled into her house, concerning her parents significantly as we explained the situation. I never saw him again after that. My dad started dating my now stepmom, and we moved to her neighborhood and switched school shortly after. I still think about him occasionally, though. His face was actually in my dream a few nights ago, which reminded me to tell this story. To this day, I don't know how he knew our names, how he knew anything about us really. It's very fucking scary to think about what would have happened to my little sister if she'd gotten in the car with that man, and what might have happened to me if I had. So a bit of backstory. I was a dancer for six years. I've worked in many cities and clubs. 
At the time of this story, I wasn't a rookie. I was well versed in the industry. At the time this took place, I was like 20 or 21. It was also in Texas, at one of the upscale clubs. I never imagined something like this would ever happen in this place, but apparently I was wrong. I started my shift at about 6pm. I liked to get there early and meet with some of my regulars before the crowds came in. It was like 8.30 to 9 and this really good looking guy came in with some friends. They were all older, like 40 to 45. I grabbed some of my hustle friends and we went and sat with them. It wasn't hard to convince these guys into a VIP room with bottle service, but this is where it gets kind of weird. The guy I was talking to wanted a separate room just for us. I thought maybe because his friend seemed rowdy and wanted to party hard, he wanted to have a more relaxed area. I wasn't complaining, because that meant I wouldn't have to share my cut of the room, so stupid me saw dollar signs and went with it. We get two bottles of Dom Perignon, some mixed drinks and shots. Now a lot of the guys that come into the strip club really wanted to let loose and brought some drugs as well. These guys had just about everything besides crack meth and heroin. I was definitely a party girl at the time too, so yes, I partook in some of these, but I also wasn't stupid. So, at this time we're all hanging out in one room together. I took a little hit of coke off the back of my hand and continued drinking. After we were all hyped up and ready to party, my guy pulled me into the other room. This guy was like six foot four, obviously worked out a lot, and was attractive. I, on the other hand, without my heels was 5 foot 6 and like 120 pounds. I sat down on his lap. I started talking to him and laying down my moves to get him to empty his wallet basically. We were having a really good conversation and my bouncers were really good about checking up on the girls in the rooms because they are pretty secluded on the second floor. After about 20 minutes of talking, something snapped and all of a sudden he puts his hands around my neck, lifted me up, and slammed me against the back of the couch. I was frozen in fear. After almost three years of dancing, I had never been in this situation. He then starts calling me names, spits in my face, and his grip on my neck would get tighter when he would feel me take a deep breath, like I was going to scream. Luckily, there was also VIP rooms across the large overlook and a bouncer noticed me kicking and flailing. I faintly remember all the bouncers running into the room. They had to pry me out of his hands. When I was finally back sitting on the couch, they had him on the floor outside the room. His buddies acted like they didn't even know him. My manager grabbed me and carried me like a baby to the dressing room, asked if I needed any medical attention. I said no, I was just really shaken up. His buddies talked to my manager, and they basically gave me guilt money for that happening. Apparently he was going through a shitty divorce and just snapped on me instead of his ex. So, to the guy at the club, strippers are people too. I have so many stories of creepy guys who follow me. I swear. It's like I have a sign on my forehead that says, Stalk me. The first guy I met while I was volunteering in the office at a nursing home, so I could get my volunteer hours for my Catholic confirmation. This was back in 2003, so I was 13. Let me preface this by saying I'm a tiny female. I always have been. At the time, I was around 4 foot 11, and I weighed about 110 pounds. So one day, I was at the nursing home working in the office, organizing mail, faxing papers, copying, you know, the normal stuff. My volunteer coordinator asked me to go drop off the mail to the residents in their room, so I do. I start off at the second floor and work my way up from there. It was fairly uneventful, until I get to the fifth floor. Here's where it starts to get weird. I go to drop off the mail to one man by the name of Ron. He was a paraplegic, but he could move his head and speak normally. He couldn't do anything else on his own besides that, and move his right hand to move his electric wheelchair around. I knock on the door. He tells me to come in, so I do, and I place his mail on the closest table. 
I then go to turn around to Lee, and he's right in front of me. I stop and kind of freeze. I really don't like talking to strangers, and the vibe I was getting just from being in the room creeped me out. I try to politely ask him to move, but he refuses. Instead, he tells me that he needs me to help him get into bed. I look at the bed and notice a whole wall full of posters of half-naked women. I definitely wasn't comfortable in the room after that. I tell him that I'm just a volunteer and I'm not allowed to touch the clients, but I'll definitely get a nurse to help him get into bed. He refuses and is adamant that I have to help him. At this point, I am thoroughly creeped out, and I hated that he was leering at me, so I politely nope the fuck out of there. I fast walk to the stairwell and run down the stairs, not even bothering to worry about dropping the rest of the mail off. I get to the office and I'm telling my volunteer coordinator what happened. And who do I see? Rob coming around the corner. Now at this point, it's time for me to go home. So I have her sign my time card and I run to the nearest bus stop. Just as the bus was pulling up, Rob comes trucking along in his wheelchair. I jump on the bus, pay my fare, and watch as he stops and stares at me as we drive past. About a week later, I go back, and this time, my coordinator asks me to help out with the activities. No problem. I like talking to most of the clients there, and the nurse that was in charge was awesome. It was my favorite thing to do, and I was seriously considering becoming an activity coordinator for the nursing home once I got old enough to do it. I was planning on staying in my position well after I got my needed hours. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well... Halfway through bingo, Rob comes rolling up. I see him and politely smile. You know the smile. Tight-lipped, doesn't reach your eyes, very standoffish. That smile. He doesn't seem to get the hint and instead parks right next to me. He talks my ear off the entire time staring at my chest. Eventually it's time for me to leave, so I get up, grab my book bag and walk out. It's fairly dark at this point. Night comes early in the late fall to early winter in the northern US. Rob follows me out, but thankfully the bus is there, so I just hop on and make my way home. He ends up doing the same thing for the rest of the time I volunteered there. When I mentioned it to my mother, she laughed it off and said that he was harmless. I fully believe that if he wasn't paraplegic, he would have been convicted of something. A year after I left the nursing home, I'm visiting my mother at work. She worked in a parking garage her brother owned, located a couple of blocks away from the nursing home. We go out to eat at the local Cuban chicken restaurant. All seems normal. I look out the window, and who do I see? Rob, sitting right in front of the window, staring at me. My mom laughs and tells me to go say hi. I refuse, and she keeps pressing it. I still refuse. My dad notices how uncomfortable he's making me, so he tells my mom to drop it and don't force me to talk to some man I clearly don't like. I seriously jumped out of my chair and hugged my dad. Rob was still sitting there, staring at me, so my dad got up and went to go talk to him. I still don't know what he said, but Rob hightailed it out of there and never tried to talk to me again. I saw him a few more times, but he always turned around and stayed away. It's been a while, and he's definitely dead now, and that brings me the greatest relief. This memory makes me sad because it involves my son as well. For a bit of background, my son's father and I parted ways a few years ago. It was decided that I stay in California, while my son goes to live with his father in El Paso. It certainly is not ideal, and I have a rough time with this, but it is what it is. Anyway, my son recently turned 11, so I decided to go on a road trip from California to El Paso. It's a long drive, but the beauty of the Southwest is definitely worth it. I'm a 31-year-old single female. I'm short and petite. I can pass for a 22-year-old. One day, as I'm in El Paso, 
I leave my hotel to go and drive over to see my son. Well, as I get in my car, a woman comes running up and frantically tells me her van is not running. She asks for $10 for gas. Well, I say no. I don't have any cash on me. I then start my car and I see the woman in my rearview mirror get into her van and drive away. It wasn't really a cause for concern. She just needed the money. Well, fast forward the same day. It's now evening. My son was hungry and wanted something to eat, so I took him to the store for a sandwich and a drink. It's dark out and the parking lot is somewhat full. My son and I get in my car and as I'm backing out of the parking space, a man yells at me in Spanish. I was so caught off guard, so as a reaction, I paused the car a little. The man proceeded to speak to me in Spanish outside of the passenger window where my son was. I quickly drive off and the man seemed disappointed. Now my son understands and speaks Spanish, so I ask him what the man said. My son told me that he heard the man say that the ignition to his van was not working. He needed me to get out and help him. The thing is, as we were driving away from the store, we looked back and the man drove away. My son said, why did that man say his car didn't work when he just drove away? I heard the unease in my son's voice, as he knows about stranger danger, but he has never experienced anything like that before. And the thing is, that happened to me twice in a day. The second time involving my son. The first one might have been nothing, but the second time was definitely not okay. It made me so sad. I work the late shift to pay for university, and I come home at around midnight. I share a house with my mom and park my car in a garage you can open with a remote control. You can get straight into the house through a door that connects the garage with the basement, which I normally do except for Thursday, where I go around our house to pull the trash can onto the street and then enter through the main door. Our house is surrounded by tall bushes, so you can't see much of the street. It's a small rural village, and I know the neighbors very well. On a Thursday night, I returned home from my shift, and when I drove into our street, I noticed an unfamiliar car with its headlights on. Since I know my neighborhood so well, I was kind of confused about the car, but I couldn't see the license plate nor the person sitting in the car clearly, since the headlights were blinding me. You only drive into our street when you live there or visit someone there, since it only circles back to the main street when you follow it to the end. I opened the gate and the garage door remotely and drove inside. From that point, I can only see the street through the gate, since the bushes are so high on both sides. I normally would have left the car and walked outside to grab the trash can, but that day I got a long voice message from a friend and stayed in my car to listen to it. Seven minutes into the message, I lift my gaze and look into my rearview mirror and I see a man standing in my driveway behind my car. He didn't move in any way. He just stood perfectly still and watched me. I panicked and locked the doors. I then grabbed the remote and closed the extremely slow closing garage door. I just sat there for a moment and was scared to leave the car, since I couldn't be sure that he did not enter the garage before the door reached the floor. I also had to call my mother because the garage door into the basement was locked since I planned to use the main door that night. She later told me that she immediately went to the window, but she couldn't see the man or the car at that point. I told myself it was probably a neighbor who didn't think about how creepy he acted, and that I didn't recognize him in the dark. But I asked around and nobody knew the man. I only got the information that that type of car was seen slowly driving around the neighborhood the last few days. My mom thinks it was somebody that wanted to surprise me, and forced me to let them into the house to rob us. My grandma had just died, and nobody knew that my mom spent the nights over. She thinks he waited behind the bushes and got impatient, or even confused when I didn't exit the car. We never found out who it was. My boyfriend at the time and I lived in different towns, so I would take the train to go see him. 
I arrived early like I normally do, and this man sat down next to me. I didn't think anything of it until he started talking to me. Where are you heading to? He asks me, which I proceeded to tell the man I'm off to see my boyfriend, who's already waiting for me. He smiles. He decided to tell me how we'd make a great family together, how he can be an uncle to me. I found that weird. He then hugged me, which I didn't know what to do after that. He said he knew me, and I asked him how. He proceeded to tell me where I worked out. My job was me dressing up in costumes that contains putting a head on, so you couldn't see who I was. The only time I ever took the head off is where I had to get completely undressed. I found this weird. He said he remembered me being much thinner, but I knew he meant my sister who also works the same job as me. My train arrived and I get on, and he decided to sit next to me. Before we sat down, he wanted a hug, and when I gave him a hug, I looked at the woman behind me and mouthed the words, Help me. She didn't respond. I sat down and he proceeded to kiss at my neck, and I pushed him away. He got upset, and I quickly got off at the next stop. I had to board another train, and ended up telling the police what happened. They tried their best to find him, but sadly, they couldn't. Ever since then, I have felt completely uncomfortable at my job. I was driving late at night on the I-90 between Deer Lodge and Missoula. The stretch of freeway between Deer Lodge and Missoula has some weird small mountain towns along the side, occasionally interrupted by large truck stops. Anyway, it's about 11.30 at night, and I'm on my way to my hotel in Missoula, when I notice that I need to get some gas from my car. I stop off in this random small town with one gas station with a 24-hour pump, it had a convenience store attached to it, but it was closed. I get this really weird vibe from the station as soon as I pulled up to the pump. I hadn't turned off my car yet. I just put it in park and the engine was still running. I was about to shut my car off when out of the corner of my eye, I see some dark figure come from the side of the closed convenience store and start running towards my car. Some instinct in my head kicks in. I put my car back into drive and got the hell out of there. I look back in my rear view to see the figure chasing after my car for a few seconds. By that time, I make a turn that gets me back onto the freeway. Needless to say, that weirded me the hell out for the rest of my drive to Missoula and Seattle. I've heard it before, and I experienced it that night. Strange things happen in the mountains. I worked for a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns. Most were fine. Some caused issues like when we caught the two of them making out in the file room. Overall, they were just normal kids from high school or college trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern later than usual, right in the middle of summer. Warner was a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age maybe late twenties. We initially hit it off pretty well, and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind since he was friendly and we had some common interests. He was the only person in my department who was even close to my age. The interns were all teenagers, and the regular staff averaged around 60, older than my mom. I was pretty psyched to have a peer to chat with, so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner or stop to talk at his cubicle. His strangeness was mostly an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness. I got zero bad vibes from the guy. It wasn't long before Warner started having major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show, or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally acted unprofessionally. One day he showed up for work at 3.15pm, when our workday ended at 4.30, the office manager was livid and told him to go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office, but I did not supervise him, and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't a big deal to me. 
If you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words. Political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle donated to the campaign of our big boss. He wasn't going anywhere. Near the end of that summer, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and relocating to a new state. Once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give a sympathetic, yeah. He would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disruptive to the people who sat near me. I found it slightly annoying, but I was also extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner, and I spent my last month there not caring about what my co-workers thought. I tolerated him lingering by my desk. One day he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus, and occasionally other co-workers would offer me rides home if they were going my way, so this didn't seem odd to me. I accepted and walked to his car with them. It smelled awful, and it was full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized. We got on our way, but once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said he didn't need to ask me that insistently. I said we could stop at a diner on the way. We had a nice meal with a pleasant conversation. He was intelligent and had a variety of interests. Our political positions aligned and we shared a disdain for our cranky old co-workers. I had a good time. I expressed that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was late, but he kept insisting so I relented. As I directed him toward my house, he started whining again about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make, and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing, and his whining faded out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street, and when I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it, laughing. I laughed in a, oh my god, what the fuck way, thinking he was joking around. When I began giving instructions about how to turn around and get back, he started begging me to keep hanging out with him, because he was lonely. This immediately set me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that I'm in a man's car, someone I don't know that well who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context I know him, and now he's displaying weird behavior outside of work as well. My instinct was not to insist I be let out of his car. I felt as if this would escalate the situation into something bad, and in hindsight, it may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person he turned out to be. I told him we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk. He seemed to like that idea, and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed. Besides the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to, until he dumped his entire life story on me, which included his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction, and related struggles with depression. I try to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this. It was a lot of highly personal information all at once and I was still on alert because of his prior behavior. I tried changing the subject by showing him pictures of my dog. I scrolled one picture too far, and the next one was a photo of me wearing makeup and posing cutely. He grabbed the phone and said, Wow, you are very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything. There was a long silence. Then he launched into a weird tangent about how compatible we are that we have similar interests and everything like that, and that he wishes I wasn't moving so we could try to hang out again, but on a date. I didn't say anything, and he broke the silence with, Sorry I'm saying all this stuff. I'm actually high right now. That's why I know where Riverside is. I went there yesterday. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it. I'm sorry. Internally, I freaked out. He had definitely put his drug addiction in past tense, and I assumed it was something he was recovering from, not currently using. I also realized I'd been in the car he was operating while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin, 
so I was clueless and I felt very, very stupid. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him, and he kept saying over and over again how nice I am and how understanding I am, that I'm pretty and smart. All of these weird compliments interspersed with talking down about himself. I didn't know what to do, so I smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry, but that I was tired and wanted to go home. That's when the crying started. He had this weird, wheezy song, but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did this, trying to come up with some sort of graceful escape plan. My patience was wearing thin, and my anxiety was through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be annoyed and panicky at the same time. I stood up and apologized, said the park was close to my house, so I'll walk, and I started to leave. When I remembered, I left my stuff in his car. Trying a new approach, I casually mentioned I forgot my stuff in his car and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers, he could keep them. He ceased his bizarre cry, stood up, ran over to his car to unlock it, and I grabbed my stuff out of his back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmed down, apologizing for making things weird. He asked if he could drop me off at my home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes, but I made him drop me off a block over from my little side street so he wouldn't see which house was mine. I could end it here, but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after the encounter. I'll make this part short. A week or two after that weird evening, the end of August by this point, I had my last day at the job and moved a thousand miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me with long ramblings, detailing his feelings about himself and about our missed opportunity. I didn't respond to these messages. Now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text stopped after a few weeks and I forgot about him. Fast forward to February and I get a text from a former co-worker. Her message said, sorry you had to hear about it this way. And her next message was a link to a local news article titled, Man Dies from Wounds in Riverside Stabbing Wednesday. Because of the way she worded it, I thought Warner was the victim, but when I read it, it included his mugshot in the charges. He was the attacker. He murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted. I couldn't believe I knew someone who killed another human. Later on, I called an old work friend for some details. Apparently, shortly after I left the job, he was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. Like he just threw anything around he could lift and poured all the soap out and smeared it all over the place. He then lost his apartment. I have to assume that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless and drug addicts who squat in abandoned houses. I wonder if the man he stabbed had refused to give him something he wanted, and that's how he reacted to a hard no. I don't think I made all the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off, since he was clearly not stable. Hands down, the worst intern I've ever encountered. So I'm a female living alone in a fairly safe apartment complex. I live on the fifth floor. On my floor, there's only my apartment, my neighbors, and a laundry room with a washer and dryer. I know most of the tenants in my building, except for my neighbor. He's only been living here for a week. I only know his name, but I've never talked to him. I only know he's an older guy from talking to another neighbor. So, at around 8 one night, somebody rang my doorbell. Through the people, I saw a guy standing in front of my door. He was like in his mid-forties. I thought that's probably my neighbor. It's normal in our complex to go introduce yourself, so I thought that's what he wanted. I only opened the door a bit. You never know, and I left the chain on. He saw me, smiled, and then he said, Hey, but he didn't say anything after that. I was already a bit confused, so I said, Hi. How can I help? He introduced himself as Bruno. Didn't say he's my neighbor or anything. I didn't say anything either. 
After a few seconds, he said, Don't be afraid. I don't bite. I was about ready to slam the door shut. If somebody tells you not to be afraid of him, there's definitely something to be afraid of. But before I could close it, he came really close to the door, almost squeezing his head in the gap. I know I should have slammed the door in his face at that point, but I was kind of shocked. Before I could do anything, he asked, Did you do this to my laundry? Confused, I looked at him, and I said, What? He then repeated, did you do this to my laundry? At this point, I was really confused. I told him that I didn't know what he was talking about. He said something along the lines of, Well, come and have a look. He then pointed to the laundry room. At that point, I noped the fuck out and slammed the door shut, double locked it, and called my boyfriend. I saw the guy stand in front of my door for at least another minute through the peephole before he left downstairs. He didn't seem angry or anything, he just had this weird blank expression on his face. My boyfriend drove to my place immediately. He checked for cars outside the complex, checked the stairwell, but he couldn't find the guy. We went to look for the laundry he was talking about, but there wasn't any. I know he didn't take it with him, because I saw him leave without any. I was looking through the people the whole time until my boyfriend arrived. He asked me if I knew the guy. And I told him that initially I thought it was my neighbor, but I wasn't sure. He went to ring my neighbor's doorbell, and I watched him through the door. And the guy that opened definitely wasn't the guy that rang my doorbell. He also didn't know anyone that matched that description. Honestly, this whole thing creeps me out so much. What would have happened if I went with the guy into the laundry room? I was walking down the sidewalk to enter my friend's apartment building around 9pm, so it was already dark outside. I had to park down the street a ways due to all the spots being filled up. As I approached her building, an older man, roughly in his late 40s, wearing a wife beater and dirty jeans, steps in front of me, facing me, gets very close to me while saying, Hey baby. I'm no stranger to the occasional harassment, so I quickly sidestep him and go on my way. To me, it seemed obvious he didn't live in the complex, since it's mostly occupied by 20-something-year-old undergrads. Now, in order to get to my friend's apartment, I have to take a smaller path to get to the back of the building. I was walking on that and didn't hear him behind me anymore. But as I enter the more unlit part, I look behind me just to check. He was right behind me, not at normal following distance. He was so close to me, I could reach out and touch him. And he was walking fairly silently, as I hadn't been able to hear him, even though we were the only ones walking around. I'm scared shitless at this point. I see some people in front of me on the stairs, so I start running toward them. I was yelling, I don't know you, please get away from me. I began to pull out my pepper spray while still running toward the onlookers, who were still on the stairs. He got flustered and ran away, and I was finally able to contact my friend and get inside. Even though he had left, the people who had witnessed this all happened to end up not saying a word to me and going back inside. I'm not sure what else they could have done at that point, but being alone while waiting for my friend to let me in made me feel incredibly unsafe. I held onto my pepper spray until I was completely inside the building. Okay, so it was a Saturday night, and me and my girlfriend were out having a few drinks at her friend's house. So it gets a little later, and we go home. I've still got some beers, which are finished at my apartment. Eat some food, and pass out on my couch. My girlfriend is in our room, so I fell asleep on my couch and hadn't locked my back door. So around 6am, Sunday morning, I'm awoken to a labored breathing sound. My groggy, half-asleep, half-hungover brain was trying to figure out what sound that was. I questioned if it was my girlfriend. No, it sounds like it's in the room with me. So I wake up a bit more, lying on my couch, and I say, Hello? 
Suddenly, a tall man stands up from laying down right in front of my couch and says, Hi, I'm Jay. So this happens and I'm very confused, thinking it's one of my friends. I say, what are you doing? I got invited here, he replied. No, you didn't, I said. He says with a more stern voice, yes, I did. That's when I went into full-on flight mode, my adrenaline pumping. I don't know how I got off my couch, but basically I sprung up at him, yelling at him to get the fuck out of my house. He backs up and says, Hey, hey, relax. So I did relax, but not enough to carry on any conversation. So, me in my green underwear and pink Floyd shirt points towards my kitchen and says get out. He starts walking and I'm following. The guy was nice enough to take his shoes off at the door. I couldn't believe it. So in my kitchen I say, what are you doing in my house? He sort of stares off out my back window, and he replied, Uh, I did a lot of drugs tonight. I started laughing and say, okay. So he gets his shoes on, I open the door for him, and he turns to me and says, You got a cigarette, man? I say, no, get the fuck out. So he leaves and I go put some pants on and do a quick walk around my place to make sure he left. And after that, I went back to sleep. This happened to me a few years back when I was in my early 20s. At the time I worked in a department store at the makeup counter. The job relies heavily on good customer service and building relationships because you want people to keep coming back to spend money on your products. We're given personalized business cards so we can build our own client base. It's not uncommon to be familiar with people who frequently shop in the store. As workers, our training is focused on being friendly and accommodating. One day while I was working, I had to move to a makeup counter that wasn't my own to cover someone else's lunch break. It was a really slow day, so I was just leaning over the counter, people watching, you know? I could tell most shoppers were just browsing, so I kept to myself. One of the people that I noticed was a very tall and broad man. He walked very slowly, almost hunched over. His face was fixed very aggressively, like he was angry, but focused. He circled around the corner a few times, but I could feel his gaze on me instead of the product. After a few rotations around the department, I decided to greet him, just in case he needed help. It wasn't until he came directly over to me that I realized just how big he actually was. I'm a 4'10", 140 pound female, so I feel pretty small regardless. But even with his slouched posture, he was over 6 feet tall and well over twice my weight. I'll never forget his teeth. They were completely black in the front. Your eyes couldn't help but go to them. Despite his menacing appearance, he was soft-spoken. Truthfully, I could tell he wasn't all there by the way he talked. He told me no when I asked if he needed help, but requested my number. It was so direct. We'd never spoken before. I declined and said that I was in a relationship and that it would be inappropriate. He then asked if he could have a business card for the counter in case he wanted to get products. Since I wasn't on my normal counter and I really wanted him to go away, I handed him my coworker's business card and told him to call if he had any questions. It worked, and he walked away after that, filling me with relief. Only a couple of minutes later, the phone on the counter rings. I answer with my preppy customer service voice and say, Thank you for calling. How can I help you? And immediately I know it's the same guy when he starts talking. He asks me again for my personal number, and I explain once again that I cannot do that. But he just wants to talk, he explains. Since he wasn't getting the hint, I say, I should have told you that I'm married. You can't have my number. Politely he apologizes and hangs up. I thought that would be the end of him. But for the next few weeks or so, I spent much of my time at work anxious that he would show up. I would see him every week and he would lurk around the corner looking for me. Anytime I would see him, 
I'd immediately drop what I was doing to run and hide or run to the closest customer and offer any bit of assistance to make it look like I was busy, just so he wouldn't talk to me. I successfully dodged him every time, and it came to the point where I stopped seeing him. I was thrilled. I had almost completely forgotten about it, until one day I decided to go to Walmart by myself to pick a few things up on my day off. I generally like to shop alone. I can take all the time I need, and I like to leisurely look around. I grabbed a basket and made my way over to the cosmetic and wellness section, since that's where most of the things I needed were. I only managed to grab a few things before I locked eyes with them as I walked by the supplement aisle. I'd recently changed my hair color and wasn't wearing my work uniform, so I didn't think he'd recognize who I was. I was ready to just go about my shopping and ignore him, until I noticed that he had dropped the items he had in his hands and started heading my way. I panicked and swiftened my pace immediately. I thought to myself, he's not really going to follow you through the store, right? But as I turned around to look, I could see his humongous body just plowing through people, with that same terrifying look on his face, only meaner, his black teeth growing closer with a snarl. Since the direction I was walking was the opposite of the exit, and there was no way in hell I was going to turn around, I decided my best course of action would be to follow the perimeter of the store and then cut through the center section which would bring me closer to the registers. I sped walk the entire time in the hopes of losing him amongst the crowd but never once turning around again. By the time I made it to the register area, I could actually feel him behind me. Still not wanting to turn around, I glanced in the reflection of the soda machines that are in between the register aisles to see how close he was. To my horror, it was only about a foot and a half to two feet between us. I was afraid to just drop my stuff and run out the door in case he followed me to my car. I parked in the far back of the parking lot and didn't want to risk it. I also didn't want to get in line at the registers since the lines were long and I would just be standing out in the open alone. Instead, I walked into a cluster of people crowded around the self-checkout line. I noticed another large but older gentleman with his carriage in the middle and ran straight for him. The people were so closely clustered together that the man following me could not make it through. I ran over to the man in line and grabbed onto his carriage. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not cutting you, but there's a man that's been following me through half the store. I need to stand with you. He was so sweet and let me be with him while we waited in line and even let me go ahead of him so I could leave quicker. As I was cashing out, I could see in my peripheral vision my stalker staring at me and pacing about, but he couldn't come near me since the self-checkout is somewhat sectioned off. By the time I had finished and grabbed my receipt, I couldn't see him anymore. I looked around, but he was nowhere. I thought about asking the older man to walk me to my car, but he still wasn't finished at the register so I decided to call my boyfriend and make a run for it. Staying on the phone, I explained to him what was going on as I sprinted to my car in tears, frantically looking around in case he tried to follow me outside. I made it to my car safely and rushed right home, breaking down to my parents about what just happened. I could feel it in my bones that the man wanted to do something to me, and thankfully I didn't find out what it was. His aggressive aura was palpable, To this day, I can still remember the adrenaline, nervousness, the sheer terror I felt when he followed me. I had never felt so vulnerable and helpless, even with all those people around. I quit that job roughly two years later. I had only seen him one other time there since the incident, but I still live in constant fear that we will cross paths again. I am afraid to shop alone, something that I would not give a second thought to years before. I was about 14 at the time of this. I was home with my brother, grandma, and my baby cousin. My brother had invited some girl over. Remember that because it's key to the story. My brother then introduced us to the girl. She looked normal but seemed a bit nervous. My grandma asked her some questions and told her if her and her brother needed anything to let her know. Anyways, 
My grandma told me to stay upstairs and allow my brother and the girl to get some privacy downstairs. Of course, me being the nosy little sister, I wanted to know everything, especially this new girl my brother brought home. I snuck down the hall quietly and looked over the banister. I saw the girl looking outside the backyard and asking my brother questions like, Who all lives here? Does this house belong to you guys? It's so nice. Hearing the conversation, I decided to listen to my grandma and go back inside my room. I began to listen to music and felt the urge to look outside my window. I then saw a 2000 Chevrolet Impala parked outside our driveway. The door was wide open and it appeared to be a man leaving our home with all of our tech items. He was packing it inside their car. The feeling of dread came over me. Yo, what's going on? I said. Then the sound of loud talking was heard downstairs and my brother said, Please, you don't have to do this. Just let us leave if you know what's best, the girl responded. I hurried and ran to my grandma as quietly as I could to let her know what I heard and saw. She didn't understand the severity of what I was telling her and began to laugh. It kind of made me upset because our life could be in danger. I heard tires screech and saw the Chevrolet and Paula speed down the street. I called out to my brother and he said, Huh, in a distraught voice. What's going on? Who was that man outside? I asked. He didn't reply. I walked downstairs and saw my brother shaking his head in disbelief, looking at where the TV used to be. The police came shortly after due to my grandma calling them. We were later informed that my brother and the girl met for the first time that day, off of a dating app, and of course they met at our home. The girl, of course, set up the entire robbery. She was just the decoy until her boyfriend came to rob us. But this part I'm about to say makes my blood run cold. The guy who robbed us held my brother at knife point, then said if he didn't comply, he would stab all of us upstairs as punishment for him getting in the way. The cops asked my brother to give them a description, but he didn't. Later on the same day, we then heard a truck park on the side of the house. Whoever was in it yelled and threw a glass bottle and drove off. I'm not sure if it was the same man who robbed us, but it terrified me nevertheless. I'm grateful nothing happened to my brother or my family. It just goes to show you that you can't trust everyone. When I was in my 20s, I was unmedicated bipolar. I was dealing with an immense amount of unprocessed trauma. Being bipolar, I was also being super promiscuous and just not making good choices. I was using OkCupid and matched with a guy. Seemed pretty normal. He worked at a smoke shop, had a dog, no kids, but was married. I came to find out they were looking for someone who would be down for a threesome. We talked for a few weeks and then he invited me over. I was manic and said yes. I walked to the street corner of my apartment and told him where I was. He picked me up in a newer BMW and we drove across town to his place. When I get there, the vibe was kind of awkward if that makes sense. I met his wife and we all chatted. She told me she was a registered nurse at the local hospital and was showing me her tattoos. After a while, he offered to make us drinks. My mom always told me to be careful taking drinks from strangers at bars and such, but my dumb ass assumed it was fine since I was already at the house. Still, I watched him. He had several mini vodka bottles and was pouring them into glasses. He added juice of some kind and served them. It tasted like an ordinary cheaply shitty drink, way too much booze and was dry. After a while, I felt super anxious. His wife had gone into the bedroom, and I was alone with her husband. Something was off. I felt nauseous and just overall get sick. I worked at the hospital and assumed I just picked up a bug. I stood up, and it felt like the entire world had shifted. I damn near fell over the couch. I didn't think I had drank that much, but I thought I must have. I picked up my bag and told him I was going to call a cab and go home. Immediately he stood up and said loudly, No, you can't. 
He said it almost too fast and frantic. It scared the shit out of me, and I knew immediately I needed to leave. I told him I wasn't staying and I was leaving. He tried to block the door, but being shorter than him, I ducked under his arm. He tried to grab my shoulder, but I shook him off and swung at him. My blow landed on his throat and knocked the wind out of him. I took the opportunity and ran as fast as I could out the door and down to the street. I had a cab number saved on my phone from a really nice cabbie. It was his personal cell phone number and was a close friend of someone I knew very well. I don't know why, but I called him. He answered groggy and clearly just woken out of a slumber. I'm sobbing as I told him what happened. He perked up right away and told me to walk to the gas station across the way and to wait for him there. Less than five minutes later, he was pulling into the parking lot. He jumped out and ran over to me. He had remembered taking me home, so he already knew the address. He told me to have a friend meet me at my house and to stay with me. My friend met us there and brought me inside. I don't remember the rest at all. Apparently I was acting erratic and making no sense. She called 911 and an ambulance came. I woke up in the hospital with doctors telling me I had such a high amount of benzodiazepines in my system that it was a miracle I had made it home alive. I filed a police report and the nurse was arrested. I'm not sure what happened from there, but I'm so grateful for the cabbie that came to my rescue. About seven years ago, right before I met my now husband, I joined a few dating apps. A few of my friends had wonderful experiences and met their now spouses, so I figured I'd give it a try. I was around 21 at the time, and had also recently lost quite a bit of weight, and was tiny for the first time in my life, so I was ready to put myself out there. I didn't take it too seriously, I let the men come to me. Eventually there was this one guy who caught my eye, Watson was his name. He was 23 and very handsome in my then opinion. We matched on Bumble and kept talking for quite a while. It turned into texting, then phone calls, and then him asking to meet up. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think I have any superpowers or can tell the future, but when he asked to start seeing each other in person, I just had an off-gut feeling. I thought maybe it was just anxiety, but later I found out I just knew. After blowing off plans and saying I was busy multiple times, he got mad and blocked me on everything. That was fine. I felt a bit bad, but I was also 21 and he gave me the creeps. So good riddance. Fast forward. Six months later, I had met and started dating my now husband. I got a message from Watson on Facebook and let him know that I had met someone new. I wished him well. He got angry, which was odd to me for someone I'd never met in person. He started calling me names, swearing a lot, so I blocked him. And then came the spam accounts, the new Instagram handles, more name calling, which turned into threats. Thankfully, he did back off and stop eventually. I was so relieved. I hadn't dealt with someone like this before or after, so I was genuinely scared. A year later, I was at Target shopping for some new shoes and makeup. I checked out. Headed to my car, keys in hand. I had just opened my door after loading my truck when I heard someone yelling my name. I turned around, thinking it was a friend or co-worker. But alas, it was Watson. I got into my car without a word. I went into fight or flight mode, and I was just ready to fly. The last thing I saw was him, standing in the middle of a Target parking lot, chasing my car. It's been years and I haven't heard or seen him again. I hope to never have another creepy encounter like that again. PSA, don't chase girls. We hate that. So back in 2014, when I was 21, I was in an on-again, off-again toxic relationship and was trying to get over him and move on, so I thought I'd give dating sites a crack. I tried a few, met a few guys, 
Some decent that never went anywhere, and some that were just plain looking for sex or had serious issues. I hadn't dated since high school as I'd been in two long-term relationships fairly close together with people that I'd known for a while. As I'm sure you can imagine, I was clueless. I wasn't used to guys trying to trick me into sex, or leading me on, or even how dating really worked. After a few failed attempts to find someone, I thought I'd broaden my horizons and really try to find someone serious. At the time I was talking to a couple of guys, the one that stood out was a really nice, slightly simple guy who I had a lot in common with. Liam. I didn't want to put my eggs in one basket, so I started talking to another guy who wasn't really my type, and that was physically or mentally, but he was smart and funny, so I thought I'd see how things played out, seeing as most guys that I pick based on gut feelings turn out to be terrible. This man who I nicknamed Guy was very, very persistent, and very cocky, which I wasn't really into, but he seemed like a cool guy on the other hand and was very knowledgeable, quick-witted, and easy to talk to. We spoke on the phone a few times and it was a reasonably good experience, but there was something about it I just didn't really like. As I mentioned previously, he was quite cocky and used to do little annoying things like hang up without saying goodbye, and had an arrogant, pushy demeanor. One day on the phone, I pulled him up on it. I told him that I believed it was all a front, and that he wasn't that arrogant, that he was a lot nicer than he let on. He told me that he had an ex-girlfriend who broke up with him because he was too much of a pushover, so he decided that women liked guys that were on the arrogant side. I told him I didn't at all. I spoke to him because I felt there was something more than that to his personality. I also picked him up on the little things in his profile, such as not liking fat chicks and other things. I am a bigger girl, so I asked him if that was going to be a problem. To which he responded that it wasn't. He had just written that to make himself look better. I accepted his excuse and hoped for the best. I decided I needed to try different kinds of men if I wanted to find someone. So I gave the guy a chance. He often suggested meeting at his place over pizza and movies. Which I wasn't comfortable with. So I suggested he come out to a club with a few friends. Which he declined and tried to convince me to come back to his place. And I really wasn't keen on that. After he clicked on that I wasn't coming over to his house in the middle of the night, he suggested we go out for coffee. As I didn't drive, he suggested that he pick me up, and I really didn't think that was a good idea, but I agreed on it in the end. We decided to go to a local coffee shop that I was quite fond of, and it was open throughout the night. At around 8, he picked me up and we exchanged pleasantries, and once we were seated, I was genuinely surprised by his attentiveness and how much interest he displayed, asking me many questions about myself. Still, something didn't sit right. It wasn't that I didn't like him, it was just something that made me feel uncomfortable. All went well, we chatted about this and that, until the question took a strange turn. Have you ever just kissed anyone just simply because you were aroused? He asked rather loudly, considering we were in a crowded cafe. I was taken aback and embarrassed. I hesitated before stuttering. Uh, no, not really. I think that's more of a man thing. I can't say I've done that, no. He then asked me a few more innocent questions before switching the topic back, asking if I liked any other sexual stuff and other oddly worded questions that I can't remember. They were sexual questions that were unusual. I lightly told him that it was rude to ask me that, but I was still tolerant of him. Not long after this, he suggested we leave. By this, I thought he meant part ways, as I knew I had to meet up with a friend not long after coffee. I was wrong. We went to the counter and he offered to pay, to which I declined. Luckily he did, because ironically, I'd actually left my wallet at home. I felt like it was such a cliche, but really guilty as it makes me feel bad when anyone pays for me. When we got into the car, he started to drive a different direction to where I lived. I asked where we were going, and he pulled up into a nearby street with little to no street lights. It was extremely dim, and we parked outside of a random house. I asked him what we were doing there, and he told me he wanted to talk in private. 
to which I responded we could talk in private, outside of my house. He argued that it wouldn't be private, and that people would look out of windows. I stupidly told him that no one would, because only my sister was home, and I would text her not to. He kicked up a bit and got slightly angry before agreeing to take me home. This should have been enough for me, but no. I was naive and lonely. When we parked out the front of my house, we started talking and he tried to lean in to kiss me, to which I kept pulling away and giving off negative body language, but still was friendly. After a little bit, he started asking me to look at him, to which I made jokes and kept my distance, until he basically turned my head and kissed me. I just went with it as I was lonely, and I thought he wasn't bad looking, and I reasoned that the kiss was just a kiss. After a few seconds, I tried to pull away, and he pulled me into a bear hug, which I half-heartedly tried to get out of, but gave up and continued kissing him. A little while later, I pulled away, and he put me in almost a headlock-type hold. Still, somehow, I wasn't concerned enough to get the fuck out of there. We stopped kissing after a bit and continued talking. He asked if I'd sit in the back seat with him to cuddle, to which I hesitantly said yes. Once we got in the back, we cuddled and talked but then he started grabbing at me inappropriately. I just kept telling him to stop because it was pissing me off. He was doing it in a jokey way, like, whoops, I accidentally brushed over you. I didn't take it too seriously until it happened a few times, and I told him that he had his feel. That enough was enough. I wasn't good at saying no to men back then, not that it's any excuse. After a couple of times, I said I was moving to the other side of the car so he couldn't touch me. I sat there and we continued talking when all of a sudden he reached out and pulled me in for a cuddle. He was playing with my hair when all of a sudden he pushed my head down, hair wrapped in his hands. I was confused and tried to push my head back up, but when he roughly pushed it down again, I realized what he was doing. I didn't know how I did it. He was around 6 foot 2 and 120 kilograms, but I managed to get out of his grip and get out of the car. As I was getting out, he yelled out to come back, that he didn't do anything. You know what you fucking did. Thanks for the fucking coffee, I said as I slammed the door in his face. I walked quickly but steadily to my front door, even though I was petrified as I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of seeing me running. He continued yelling out that he'd done nothing wrong the whole time I was walking. I banged down my front door and my younger sister opened it to see me in tears. I told her what happened and eventually settled down. I swiftly blocked him on Facebook and vowed to never talk to him again. I kid you not, three days later while at work, I received a text message from him. Hey, you want to get coffee tonight? No, I replied. Why well, reply then, he said. After an hour of no response, he had messaged. I see what you did there. I'm just curious why you'd even bother asking, I said to him. Because I think you're cute. I'm curious why you're answering, he messaged me. I sent him a picture that read, You smell like hidden motives. Get away from me. I'm pretty sure my motives tasted fine when my tongue was down your throat the other night, he messaged back. I never made contact again after that, and I blocked his number. A few years on, I was telling someone about him and decided to unblock him on Facebook to show her when I noticed that I now had a mutual friend. The mutual friend was a girl I'd been extremely close with in high school who confessed to me that she'd been assaulted from a child onward. I was the only one she'd ever told, and I helped her find the courage to put the piece of shit away, so naturally I freaked and messaged her. I told her the whole story and she was stunned. She told me that he worked with her and now lectured something to do with justice at our local university, which was laughable. She told me that he harassed her for months about going on a date with him and would occasionally get quite nasty. In all the time she knew him, she felt uncomfortable around him, even when he was nice. She felt kind of intimidated most times. He would guilt, pressure, and have a go at her about this date, or not messaging him back. Very full-on, almost stalkerish. 
She ended up getting a boyfriend, and he was furious. She didn't hear from him after that. Judging by our time frames, she met him around three to six months after I did. I'm sure I've left some minor details out, as it's a bit blurry, and sadly my dad died after the incident. So thank you for listening. I'm a 5 foot and 115 pound girl, and my sister was about 5 foot 6 and about 150 pounds at the time of this incident. I was 22 and my sister was 18. We grew up pretty rough, so we were tough, fearless, and a bit crazy. So my family, consisting of my mom, my dad, my sister, and my twin brothers, were vacationing and also meeting new family members who lived in Florida. We were also staying with them at their new house and helping them settle in. My family was drinking by the pool until about 11pm when all the older people went to bed. My sister, my brothers and I are drinking and playing cards when we all became determined to find some weed. So we all made tenders and tried to find someone to sell us weed. So about an hour later, my brothers and I give up, but my sister was determined. Now mind you, at this point, we were all pretty drunk. My sister tells me that she has someone who's on their way, and they're gonna pick her up and smoke her up. I tell her we should just go to bed, but she refuses and says it will be fine. So being her big sister, I couldn't let her go alone. Plus, from the pictures, he was scrawny and wore glasses, and my sister assumed that she would fuck him up if he tried anything. I decided to bring my knife to be safe. This guy had no idea I was coming with my sister. At this point, it's 1am and she says he's down the street. We set up a plan to get out without our parents knowing and tell him the address is a street over. We walked in complete darkness in fear that our parents would see the light from our phones. On the way, we came up with fake names and fake backstories. We were walking down the street, we told him, as he pulled onto the road in this beat up piece of shit car. He was hesitant about me, but he ended up letting me come along. My sister asks him if he had a Dutch, and he says he doesn't, so we go to find a gas station to get one. On the way to the gas station, my sister chats with him about where they're going to smoke, and he says he knows a safe spot, and that it was a little far, like half an hour away. My sister and I were worried about getting caught up, so we agreed. We get to the gas station and my sister goes inside and paid for some gas for him and gets a Dutch. While she was inside, him and I talked about comics. He said that he always roots for the villains and gave me this creepy smile when he said it. That gave me the creeps, but I smiled my own creepy smile back. I always think, if they think you're crazier than they are, they won't fuck with you, which I still believe today. We stood there like that until my sister got back about a foot apart, just smiling creepily at each other for about two minutes. I didn't speak the entire car ride. The safe smoking spot was not a half hour away, it was an hour. My brother had also given me money to try to get him some bud if I could. He was supposed to let us in in case we got locked out. He kept texting me, so I kept texting my sister, trying to decide what to say to our brother. We finally get to this spot, and it's a parking lot. We sit there for a solid five minutes of silence. My sister looks at him and says, Do you want me to roll up? I need the bud. He looks at her and says, I don't have any bud. I thought you did. We can go to my friend's house. It's not too far. Now this was weird, because in the messages he sent to my sister, he told her he had bud. My sister and I were pissed, but trying to be nice. After my sister declined and asked if he could just bring us back, he playfully touched her upper thigh with that same creepy smile. My sister grabbed his hand pretty tight from the looks of it and said, I want to go home now. She said it through her teeth and you could hear the anger in her voice. I pulled out my knife to be ready to hold it to his neck if I had to, as I was right behind him in the back seat. I think he may have heard the click of my knife opening, because his whole demeanor changed. He said he would bring us back. I didn't trust him, so I kept checking the GPS. 
and sure enough, he started driving the wrong way. That's when I spoke up for the first time in over an hour. You're going the wrong way. If you don't take us the fuck back, you'll be fucking sorry, I snapped. I was furious at that point. I really didn't want to have to attack him. He didn't say a single word. He just turned around and started going the right way. The rest of the ride was silent. Once we were on the street over from the house, he stopped the car and let us out. I didn't get out of the car until my sister did, but right before she did, he grabbed her face and tried to kiss her before she got out. She turned her head to the side and pushed him off her as she got out. Be safe out there, cuties. I remember him smiling that creepy smile again, and then waving to us. We must have waited ten minutes for him to finally leave. We ran back to the house, freaking out the whole way. We got inside and went to bed pretty shaken up. We can only imagine what would have happened to us if we went to his friend's house, or if I didn't bring my knife. When I was 17, my brother, who was 13 at the time, and myself were traveling in northern British Columbia in mid-November. We were in Pine Pass between Chetwynd and Prince George, BC. Anyone who knows this area knows how desolate it is. I'm talking hundreds of kilometers between gas stations and any kind of people or buildings. We were just about at the Powder King Ski Resort turnoff, and it was getting late. We pulled into a roadside turnout around 10 to 10.30 p.m. because I was getting really tired. My brother was already sleeping. I pull in and park near some tourist signage, lock my doors, and put my seat back to sleep. I am dead asleep when something snapped me awake. To this day, I'm not sure what it was that woke me up. I was looking around trying to figure out what was happening when all of a sudden my car was surrounded by four to five men. They started yanking on the door handles, trying to get into the car. I'm not sure if they saw I was awake or not, but I sat up, slammed the car in drive, and peeled out of there. I'm not sure if I hit one of them or not, and I didn't care to check. I didn't stop again until I was at my aunt's house in Prince George. I used to work at the docks of a salmon cannery in Bumfuck, Alaska. 16 hour days, 7 days a week. No days off from May until August. It was a really cool job, but lots of seedy characters. Seasonal work in remote places seems to attract people who don't really fit with normal society, or people who want to get away from something. Gary was one of those people. He had worked at another cannery in town that was owned by the same parent company. And in the lead up to the fishing season, he was lent out to our cannery for some carpentry tasks. Gary was probably in his 40s or 50s. Gray hair, weird delivery in his speech. Not like a speech disorder, just weird. It was kind of like he was smiling inside about something grotesque while he spoke. When he first got to our camp, he was telling me the HR staff kept asking him all these personal questions. I asked what kind of questions and he responded that they wanted his full name and phone number. He told them he didn't feel comfortable with that, and would be willing to work for a reduced rate if he could just keep that information to himself. Big red flag. One day I'm working with a co-worker on a small welding project, when Gary pops out of the doorway. He says, Hey, you guys want some meat? We've been eating cafeteria food for weeks, and working hard enough that we always maintained a caloric deficit. You don't say no to food. He cut us each off a slice. Smoked something. Now here's some personal info on me. My family is Eastern European. I was born in New York City and then spent half my childhood in North Carolina. I've been eating smoked meats of every variety all my life. It's a piece of my culture, basically. I don't know what the fuck this was. It was almost pork, but it was not pork. Gary says... You guys like that? To which we respond sheepishly. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Gary lets out a slow and creepy laugh, and then he fucking leaves. Now me and the guy I'm working with look at each other. We laugh it off and say shit like we just ate Gary's wife. 
It's very dark vibes, and I love that shot. Anyway, later that night, I'm in the cafeteria alone eating a bagel. Gary walks in. Hey man, did you like that meat earlier? Yeah, Gary, it was good, I respond. That's funny, man, Gary says, and he lets out a soft laugh. I'm pretty sure I ate a slice of Gary's wife. I was on my way through Mississippi on Interstate 55. I pulled over at a rest stop I've been to a million times before, just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I went to use the bathroom, and I had something unusually scary happen. This was around 11.30ish, so the rest stop was mostly dead, aside from truckers pulled into spots sleeping. I've stopped at this one before, because it's pretty well lit and has security, which anyone familiar with Memphis knows is a blessing. Now, I'm a pretty big guy, 6 foot 1, 180 pounds, yada yada. I'm not usually intimidated by places like that, but that night was different. I walk into the bathroom and things seem normal, but the handicapped stall at the end was closed. I didn't think much of it at the time. However, after I walked up to the urinal, I started getting a weird feeling in my gut, kinda like when it's dark outside and you can't really tell if a tree is just a tree, or something else, you know. I brush it off and unzip to get my business done so I can get back on the road. As I'm standing there, I hear shoes move. That sinking feeling turned into alarm bells almost immediately. I hear the stall door unlock and someone start running. Now this isn't a long bathroom, so I panic. I turn on my heel as I'm standing and I book it for the door as I hear someone behind me running. I didn't stop or turn my head to look or anything. I just ran. I made it back to my car, but I didn't see anyone come out of the bathroom while I cranked it, and I certainly didn't hang around to see if anything else was going to happen. It may not sound like much, but this was one of the few times I actually felt some deep urge to get the hell out of there. So... Whoever it was that caught me, quite literally, with my dick out, I hope you slipped in my piss. I had a very creepy friend called Ben. I believe he might be a dangerous psychopath, or at worst, a serial killer. Ben and I met on Facebook in 2014 and he came to me in Romania in the summer of 2050. He seemed a bit odd, but otherwise okay. One strange thing about him is that while he was at my house for a week, he didn't bathe for some odd reason, so we stank. So I show him around Transylvania, and we both rent an apartment in Bucharest before his departure. We hang around Bucharest, and he leaves. Our friendship continues online, and in 2016, I moved back to Canada. In May of that year, I fly over to Vancouver to hang out with him. Now, it is important to know that this guy is a major gun nut. He collects a lot of firearms and claims to have briefly been in the Canadian Army. He also claims he worked as a mercenary and was in Georgia during the Russian invasion of 2008. He claimed to have shot two people there and also suffers from PTSD. I get there and his apartment is filthy. I'm talking trash everywhere. Two cats that made the place stink of cat piss. The guy kept his lights on 24-7, and on his wall was a clock that played a loud tune every hour. His behavior towards me while there was somewhat disrespectful, but I just took it as a buddy messing around with me. He said mildly creepy things, but again, I brushed it off as him being a prankster. I leave, and again our friendship continues online. During this time, his conversations with me became darker and more hostile, in a passive-aggressive sort of way. Ben is also a hardcore alcoholic, who drinks until he passes out. He does all sorts of antisocial and downright vile things while drunk. During the 2016 to 2017 period, he said that two men briefly lived with him for a short time. When I pressed him about what happened to those two men who lived with him, he changed the subject quickly. 
After what happened in 2018, when I last met up with Ben, I have a strong suspicion something bad might have happened to them. So fast forward to 2018, and me and my parents are driving to Vancouver from Calgary. Perfect time to meet up for a day or two with Ben. Big mistake. Ben is traveling from Kelowna to Vancouver, and we meet up at a bar near his house. We have a few drinks, and he goes home for the night. The next day we meet up, and his behavior towards me is disrespectful in a passive-aggressive way, and extremely creepy. We go to his workplace, and he's very subtly disrespectful to me and his co-workers. He's putting me on the spot and trying to make me look stupid to everyone around. He was a supervisor, so most of the people underneath him were too complacent or afraid to say anything. This man is obviously a psychopath. This is where it gets to a point where I believe my life was in danger. We go back to his place. He's drinking beer and I'm rolling a joint. A movie is playing and Ben is getting tipsy. He's basically now adopted a speech pattern in our conversation where I feel as though I'm being interrogated and toyed with. He's playing a video game on his computer. I'm watching a movie. By this time I'm feeling very uneasy. My gut instinct is telling me to leave. Generally speaking, you always listen to your gut instinct. That primal thing inside you linked to fight or flight is best to be obeyed. Now as the day progressed, and as Ben was becoming drunk, he starts saying very weird things. He was mumbling about, I don't care for anyone but myself. I don't give a shit about people. There's a loaded shotgun beside the table. He looks at his computer screen and starts mumbling about being a madman with a gun. A few minutes later, he turns to me and says, Hey, what if I put some MDMA in your drink? Followed by, I'm just kidding. The cat and mouse game continues. He's now talking about knowing a guy who's HIV positive, and how he's going to get the guy to give him an infected needle to infect himself with HIV, just so he can live on government benefits for the rest of his life. This guy is fucking unhinged. I'm sitting there in disbelief at just how vile this guy really is. I want to leave, but I also don't want him to know I'm ready to go. It's an awful, vulnerable feeling. He has another beer and turns to me. I'm now very uncomfortable. The talk is now about food. He turns to me and looks me straight in the eyes and asks, So, if this was your last meal, what would you have? The look on his face was one of stone-faced sincerity and malice. I knew I had to flee, my heart pounding. I need to make my move. With adrenaline rushing through my body, I tell Ben in a very calm manner that the weed I had is making me feel funny and I need to get a breath of fresh air. I quickly put my shoes on and leave before he has any chance to stop me. He makes me promise I'll be back. I go down the stairs into the sunlight. I feel like an animal that just escaped slaughter. The place I'm staying at is not too far from Ben's house. I'm wise enough not to tell him where I'm staying at exactly. I start walking, feeling like I've just escaped certain death. The phone rings. Ben is asking where I'm at and that he's panicking. I tell him I'm still taking a breather. Meanwhile, I get to my cousin's house. I somehow managed to get inside. Night has fallen. The guy is calling my phone constantly. When I answer, he's trying to get me to meet up with him and go for a ride. The tone of his voice is flat and fake. He says that we've just had a bad night. He's desperately trying to get me to go for a ride with him. I block his number. I also block him on social media. That was the last time I spoke to the scumbag. In our many online conversations over the years, Ben would drop clues here and there about his past, that he did horrible things during his supposed gig as a mercenary. He would go on drunken tirades about being a bad man having done bad things. He was going to AA meetings and trying to put on a facade of normality by volunteering at an old folks home. Deep down, I think he's a psychopath, a potentially dangerous one at that. I just hope he never murdered anyone other than the two people he allegedly shot while on combat duty. Vancouver is a sketchy place full of missing people. I guess we'll never know.
The other day, I was grocery shopping at my local Walmart with my four-month-old. While I was loading up my vehicle, I heard someone say, Excuse me, from behind. My cart was very full to the point of almost overflowing with larger items, so I thought maybe something fell out of my cart or I left something behind in the store. As I turned around, there was a woman about two feet away from me, which in itself startled me. She was holding a bouquet of wilted flowers and was handing me a rose saying, Happy Mother's Day. Out of instinct, I reached out and took the rose from her. I immediately became hyper aware of my surroundings and instinctively grabbed onto the cart which had my son in his car seat still in it. Happy Mother's Day, she said. Thank you. I need donations. My child is very sick. She then tries to show me a laminated but old looking piece of paper, but it was under her arm holding it. Oh no, I I'm sorry, I don't have any cash on me to give you. She stared at me for a few seconds. But my child, I need donations. I was starting to get nervous. I'm really sorry, I wish I could help, but I can't. I handed the rose back to her. You don't want it? My child is very sick. You keep the flower for yourself, and I hope your child gets better. Sorry, I said to her. She grabs a flower from me and starts running to other people in the parking lot. I was really scared and started to almost panic, so I put my son into my vehicle, trying not to touch him with the hand I was holding the flower with, because of stories I've been told and seen. I then got into my vehicle and locked the doors. I started washing my hands with the sanitizer I keep in the vehicle. I sat in there for a few minutes, making sure nobody was around me and nothing was happening to me. I then filed a report for suspicious behavior. Maybe I overreacted and this woman really was looking for help for her child, but the whole situation seemed fishy to me. Especially after she left me, she went after other people and was even banging on their car windows. While I was filling the police report, I watched a man drive around the same area of the parking lot, taking pictures of the same vehicles and parking in multiple different spots, then moving. Needless to say, I got the hell out of there. When I was around seven years old, my mom and I lived in these apartments in a border town. My mom's a single mother. Anyway, in our apartment complex, like most, it had a playground in it. Luckily, our apartment was on the bottom floor and right next to the playground. Like most children, I loved playing there. Every day I'd play there. I honestly can't remember, but my mom either went inside the apartment to grab something, or she let me play alone. But while she was gone, a random lady approached me. I've never seen this lady before, but she told me she had a huge Barbie doll house and a lot of toy Barbies. She told me she lived not too far and asked if I wanted to go and play. I remember saying, I have to ask my mom first, and that's when she said she knew my mom and that it's okay. I didn't know any better and agreed to go. She grabbed my hand and led me to her house. She did have a lot of Barbie toys, and I was playing but she didn't have any other children around, so I'm not sure why she had all these dolls. Apparently I was gone for some time because it was starting to get dark, and that's when there were loud bangs on the door. The lady opened the door and it was my mom. She looked so frightened. She grabbed me and we moved out of that apartment complex soon after that happened. Honestly, I don't remember what happened after that. This memory came back to me not that long ago, and my mom told me that it was the worst thing that's ever happened. I don't remember feeling afraid, but honestly who knows what that lady had planned for me. Since we lived five minutes from the Mexican border, it's known for trafficking children, and I could have easily been taken to Mexico and never seen again. My mom did tell me the reason she found me was because a bystander saw me walk off with a lady, and then saw my mom frantically looking for me. I had a creepy encounter happen to me while backcountry camping in Shenandoah a couple of years ago. 
It was the first summer of the pandemic in early July. My partner and I took our two dogs for a weekend backpacking trip to Shenandoah. We planned to hike and camp for three days and two nights. We do this often, but went to the northern section of the park this time, which was unusual for us. We had plans to find a particular swimming hole. After hiking well into the woods and away from the Skyline Drive and the AT all day, we got close to the small flats that leads to the swimming hole. We found a great spot far enough off the trail that it was not visible from the trail. You had to cross a little stream to get to it. After setting up camp, we take the dogs about a half a mile to swim. This spot is totally incredible. It felt like something from another time. There were a couple of other people swimming, but each said they were hiking through and left before we did. We hike back to the campsite, have dinner, play cards, and then crash. We didn't see another soul. We have a dome tent that is entirely see-through when the rain flies off. That night, I keep getting partially awoken by what I thought in my half-asleep state was the moonlight shining directly in my eyes several times throughout the night. I even remember rolling over half asleep and covering my face and thinking, Jesus, how bright could the moon possibly be? I considered putting the rain fly on in the middle of the night, which would block it out, but I never really fully woke up enough to do it. So I was really confused when I woke up in the morning and the rain fly was on. I asked my partner, and he said we decided to put it on before we went to sleep, so apparently it had been on all night. There was no way the moon was shining bright enough to wake me up multiple times through the fly. In retrospect, it felt like someone was periodically shining a light in my face when I was asleep, and then would turn it off when I opened my eyes. I'd swear that the dogs and my partner never woke up. It would have been so far from the realm of possibility to me that someone randomly stumbled on our campsite, since it was not easy to see and even harder to access. I never could determine for sure what it was, but I couldn't shake the feeling like something strange had happened. When I was 15 years old, my friend and I used to walk from school to her house on Friday afternoons to start our weekends. We'd usually stop at this sub shop in town for an early dinner or snack to eat while we played video games and hung out. After we got our sandwiches, we walked outside to continue to her house. Outside the sub shop, there was this man sitting on a bench outside. I didn't see him when we walked in. He was really tall and muscular, around six foot five. He was pale and bald, early to mid thirties and very intimidating, and also wearing a bright orange sweatshirt. The hairs on the back of my neck instantly stood up as soon as I saw him. I noticed right away that after we passed him, he got up from the bench and started walking behind us. It's not that weird, maybe he was just going on his way, but what made me instantly realize this dude wasn't right was that he was holding his phone to his ear, but not talking at all. This was just before smartphones became a thing, so it wasn't like he was just swiping along on Tinder or checking Instagram. In this time, if you had your flip phone out and clearly weren't talking to someone, that was weird because the only thing you did with cell phones was actually speak to people. He did this for so long that he could have been listening to a voicemail. I had the gut feeling that something was wrong, so I stopped walking and pretended to fumble around for something in my purse, just so the man ended up in front of us and was no longer behind us. I tell my friend why I pretended to stop walking. She kind of blew me off that I was being paranoid. We start walking again, and there was a gas station up ahead. You could either walk across the gas station to the main road, or go down a side road around the gas station. That will also eventually get you to the main road, but just a bit of a longer route. My friend and I cut through the gas station, and the man went around it and ended up back behind us again. He was still holding his phone to his ear, but not speaking. At this point, I'm internally freaking out. I know he's following us. I'm trying to play it cool and come up with a plan, while my friend still doesn't take me seriously. We get to the turn that's a shortcut to my friend's house. Now this road was pretty remote. Cars don't usually drive down there that often. There isn't a house for quite some time. 
but it was the faster way to get to my friend's house. Just past this road was a large shopping center. I told my friend that if we start to walk down this remote road and the man follows, that he's 100% following us because nobody really goes down this road ever. I told her that I would book it to the closest store in the shopping center. I would turn around to check where the man is and he somehow got significantly closer to us and of course he started walking down the road. We made eye contact and he gave me the creepiest grin. I instantly started running with my friend following me. We run into a right aid and while the guy continues to follow, he doesn't go into the store. We get into the store and the cashier takes notice that we're freaked out. She asks us what's wrong, so we tell her. She asks if we need the police, but we decline. I just call my dad instead to pick us up and drop us off at my friend's house. My dad arrived about 10 minutes later with the cashier clerk keeping an eye on us. The man was nowhere to be found yet. My dad wanted to find the guy, but my dad was older in his 60s, and the man was in his 30s and big so he definitely would have beaten my dad up or worse. I just begged for him to get in the car and get away from here. Here's the creepiest part of the story. As we're getting in the car, I see the man pop up in the parking lot from behind a parked car, and then he started walking the other way. That guy was definitely waiting for us to come out of the store, follow us, and then do God knows what. I didn't say anything because I didn't want my dad to try to fight him. I didn't want something bad to happen. It just confirmed that this creep was following us and planned to do us some harm. Thankfully my friend and I were fine and I never saw the guy again, but my friend told her friend about the incident and she had said she knew the guy because he lives near her. He's definitely a creep and has had multiple complaints against him. I haven't heard of or seen him after that. I hope he never did any harm to anyone. I still think about this story 12 years later, and it's the reason I'm so aware of my surroundings at all times, especially when I'm walking alone. So in 2019, I traveled to Japan with my mom and friends. We didn't know how to speak Japanese, and we only spoke English. We were in the subway station to go to Shinjuku. In the subway, a Japanese lady who was like 20 started talking to us in English. So we started conversing, and when the lady got out of the subway, she showed us her phone with Google Translate, and on the phone it was written, Watch your back. I don't know if it was a translation mistake or something, but this really intrigued me. This is where the weird things begin. After we got out of the subway, I couldn't stop thinking about that message. I was constantly watching behind me. Then I turned around for like the third time, and I saw my passport on the floor. I picked it up and walked away. I don't know if it was chance, but without this woman, I probably would never have looked back and I would have lost my passport. So I am a very, very active skater, and I often go out to street spots to try to skate them. A lot of the time, I meet some less than savory people, but this time, it took the cake. So let's set the scene. It's around 6.30pm, a perfect day for skating, and I'm just getting a spot around a public park called Rosa Park Circle. I was doing my thing when this man came up to me. He told me that I was doing a good job. Hey. You're doing a really good job, he said. Hey, thanks. I've been working on skating for a while now, and I think I've been doing a really good job recently, I replied. I tend to trust people too much. Well, you're doing a really good job. My name is Jay. I'm 55 years old and bi. At this point, I kind of knew what was coming. I'm very good at detecting people's implications, thankfully. Throughout this entire conversation, he kept mentioning his sexuality. I tried my absolute best to get out of the conversation when I could. I was trying to do a few tricks down a small ledge. The guy was just staring at me while I was doing it. I felt really uncomfortable. He pulled me aside one more time, and this is what he said. I really like you. I know that you're only 15, but... 
We can't still hook up. No, we can't. I'm only 14. Consent in this state is 16. I'm not really comfortable with the things you're saying. I need to get home. It was nice to meet you, Jay, but I need to leave. Okay, but remember, don't tell anybody. I told my parents. After they got off the phone with my sister, they called the police to make a report about this man. I was extremely livid on my way home, and it didn't help that my entire playlist on YouTube is full of hard rock. I went back to the skate park shortly after, and he was there. He told me that we were such good friends and that he was drunk and sorry. I skated past and looped around. I also took a picture of him. I think he was still drunk because he straight up rattled off his name. He said his name was Leon, which is not the name he gave me originally. I moved to a new area, and so, I was learning my new bus routes and stops to and from uni. I was on my way home en route in the evening, and as I tapped my car, there was a lady probably in her 60s sitting up front at the seat behind the bus driver. As I got on, she wrinkled her nose up at me. I chalked this up to her maybe being a little old-fashioned, as I was wearing ripped jeans and an ACDC shirt, but I don't look tough or mean in any respect. I was kind of taken aback by her intense reaction, but I soon forget about it. By the time I pressed the button to call for my stop, the bus driver overshot and missed it, which he realized immediately and apologized for, to which I replied, It's okay, no worries. And he goes to pull over at the next stop further up. The bus was empty at this point, save for a person up in the back and the grumpy one up front. And as I got up to get off, the older lady turns right around in her chair with the ugliest look and begins to berate me in a loud voice. Are you stupid? Why would you press that button, you idiot girl? I hope you never drive. You'll kill someone. You've wasted my time, you idiot. Over and over. The bus driver looked back for a second, dumbfounded, but ultimately stayed out of it. She had these dagger eyes fixed on me as she just became louder and more angry. I just ended up avoiding her gaze as I was so confused and intimidated. I was half in shock of how nasty and loud she was being towards me. So when the next stop came, I quickly made for the exit, and all I could say was, Yeah, okay, cool. She just leaned towards me, almost sticking her face into my shoulder, that I felt her brush against me as I walked past. I was freaked out to say the least and darted out the door, and I hear her growl another insult under her voice as the doors close. So, for a bit of backstory, I was about 16 at the time, and I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes, so I had fake blood running down my face. I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now I knew as I was boarding my bus, people would stare or ask questions, so I wasn't surprised when this man, who looked to be in his mid-thirties, started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual, oh wow, did you do that yourself, kind of stuff. I answered the questions as I normally would, and expected the conversation to be done and over with. Oh, was I wrong. This man, he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the maker, and if I was on my way to see him now. I lied again and said he likes the makeup, and yes, I was going to see him trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down a bit until he said, You know, you remind me a lot of my sister, he said with a grin. I just smiled in response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from me, Joe continued, My sister was kind of a bitch. She was always lying about me to our parents. I had fantasies about breaking her jaw. Now at this point I was terrified, 
my bus stop was still another 20 minutes away. I just wanted to be out of the situation. Seeing that what he said had made me uncomfortable, he switched the subject. He started telling me about where he worked and what he does there. I just nodded along to what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says to me, Why don't you come to my house? I have a freezer full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we can hang out for a while. To which I politely declined, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get to my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that. I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again, but one afternoon, I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting onto that bus again, but I was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping, and as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe standing out by the doors, staring at me. The second I was out of the doors, he walked over to me, a grin on his face, and he wrapped his arms around me. I pulled away from him, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asked me, Well, what are you doing? I have time, I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying I really couldn't. I had to go. And then I walked away, heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down the heavily populated makeup aisle keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, This color would look gorgeous on you. I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then placed the lipstick in my basket and walked away, leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after he left afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket, and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now I don't know if he followed me or not, but I can say that after a day, the motion detector porch lights started coming on at night, and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after that, and I haven't seen Joe since. This happened around 10 years ago now. I was around 13 to 14 and pretty small at the time. It was during the winter period, so at the time I was coming home from extra scholar activities. It was already dark around 6pm. I stepped out of the bus and still had a 5 minute walk. The area we were living in wasn't the best and my older brother always told me to hold my keys in hand, ready to protect myself. Three keys between my fingers like I'd be Wolverine or some shit like that. I saw a guy walking toward me, but he didn't really raise any red flags. He was just a guy walking home. He didn't look at me or sped up when he saw me. Nothing. After he passed me though, he grabbed me by the jacket and threw me onto the floor. He was quite a big guy, while I could compare my weight to an oversized chicken. The guy starts kicking me and punching me, and after the initial shock, I did the only thing that came into my head. I pulled my keys out of my pocket and stabbed him with all the strength in his thigh. One key went right in. He screamed in pain and fell to the ground. I used this opportunity to get the fuck out of there. After two minutes of sprinting, I was home, bleeding from my face and crying. I told my parents everything. We went back to where he grabbed me, but there was only some blood on the floor, but there was no sign of him. We reported the incident to the police and never heard anything back from them. My parents decided to buy me a pocket knife after that, and my older brother got me a better one, which I still have, and is pretty cool. I'm a male, and at the time of this story I was 23. Sometimes when I go a long time without talking to anyone, my voice comes out weird when I finally do talk. Most of the time I remember to clear my throat or something, but sometimes I'll just start talking and it will sound weird. 
So one such occasion, I was riding the metro home to College Park, Maryland. I worked in DC at the time, and my ride home was usually around an hour. On the train there was a cute girl. I try not to constantly look at girls on the train because I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. It seemed though, like every time I did glance at this girl, she looked right back at me immediately afterward. I was hoping that she kept looking at me because she thought I was cute or something too, but was worried that due to coincidence, that every time she checked to see if I was looking at her, I was, and that it seemed like I was just constantly staring at her. She finally got to my stop around 11pm. I was the only person that got off the train at this stop, except for the cute girl. At the College Park metro station, there's a large parking garage where I had parked my car. I'd gone to work late in the day, so my car was parked on the fourth floor. I got onto the elevator and noticed the cute girl was already in it with me. She pressed number two. I thought to myself that she must be extremely lazy or tired to take the elevator one floor. As if she read my mind, she answered, saying, It's not that I'm lazy, it's just that the stairs can be pretty scary at night. Now this is when my inactive throat thing comes in, and trust me when I say, I have absolutely no idea why I said this. I turned to her and said in a very gargly voice, the elevator can be a pretty scary place too sometimes, and then kind of got a tickle in my throat and started clearing it, but it could have sounded like I was grunting. At that moment, the elevator got to her floor, and she just booked it. I moved to a large American city back in February, and this happened one of my first weeks living here. I got onto a pretty crowded subway on my way home from work. A lady got on and sat down next to me. She looked mid-thirties and was pretty and put together. Two girls got on right behind her, and immediately I noticed her watching them. Pretty much straight away, she started talking to them, saying, Oh, don't touch the subway pole. That's gross pretty normal so far, and considering how forward she was being, I figured they knew each other, but she kept going. No, seriously, don't touch it. What are your names? Where are you from? Still not too weird, yet I started feeling nauseous. It seemed off. She was too persistent. They answered her questions at first, but then it got more personal. How old are you? Are you sisters? Where are your parents? Where are you staying? They were 14 and 50. She tried to figure out exactly which hotel they were staying at. They would dodge the questions or answer vaguely. They were visibly uncomfortable, and when she asked for their room number, they turned their backs to her. Meanwhile, I want to say something, but I'm new here, and I'm freaking out. I would have just brushed it off as some weird lady being too friendly, but the alarm bells were going off, and everything felt wrong. I felt like if I stepped in, maybe she'd turn her sights onto me. In retrospect, of course, I wish I stepped in, but in the moment I was frozen and trying to downplay the whole thing in my mind. It's that feeling of panic when you're not sure if the panic is justified. Also, she would mumble something under her breath every so often. I couldn't hear what she was saying. I didn't see a phone, but there may have been headphones under her hair or scarf that I wasn't aware of. I should note that the subway was packed at this point, so it would be difficult for the girls to move away from her. I'm assuming the girls got the attention of the lady in front of them, and they signaled for her help, because she started pretending to be their mom, answering questions for them. Though the creepy lady was still directing her questions at the girls' backs, I don't think she'd been paying attention the whole time, because she seemed more confused than alarmed or concerned. The acting mom's answers were contradicting the girl's answers from before, and the lady didn't like that. She started grilling the mom, saying, I thought you were from Florida. The girl said their parents were back at the hotel, among other things to show that she knew this was not their mom. So the Times Square stop rolls around, and the lady says, Girls, this is your stop. If this is really where your hotel is, get off now. She said that as she's starting to stand, as if she's getting off as well. They're completely ignoring her now, with their backs turned. 
At the next stop, they hurry off with the lady acting as the mom, almost running. And of course, to my horror, the creepy lady jumps up to follow them out. That's everything I can recall. Once I had a few minutes to process everything, I had a panic attack. I got back to my apartment and cried. It still messes with me months later. I have some general anxiety, but I don't usually fixate on things like this. I think what gets to me is that my instincts were telling me that this wasn't your average subway weirdo. This seemed bad, like possibly sex trafficking or something. And the way she was so persistent, even though there were witnesses, even though this mom figure stepped in to help, and who was she talking to so quietly? I don't know. Was she just a weird lady, model scout, or something worse? Thanks for listening. I feel a bit relieved getting this off of my chest. Years ago, I was on the city bus on my way to the mall where I work. This is a trip I make like 7 or 8 times a week on average. It's a fairly long ride. So there I was, sitting in my usual seat, minding my own business. Headphones in, derping around on my phone and keeping to myself. When a man who'd gotten on the same stop as me shifted into the seat next to me. This guy was bigger than me, in a ratty t-shirt and shorts. He looked pretty dirty, and his eyes were open really wide and were a bit scary. He tried to get my attention, so I took my headphones off and gave him my attention. When I did, he started mumbling. I know I'm not a very attractive male, but I find you very attractive. And I cut him off, knowing where this was going. I said to him, I have a boyfriend. He got a little more gruff at this and insisted, Will you take my phone number? To which I quickly replied, No, and I put my headphones back on turning back to the window, just wanting this to be over. He moved back to his seat, and for a few minutes I stared out the window and listened to my music. I felt kind of bad and thought about apologizing for being so blunt about it. It's just that if I dance around a rejection like that in an attempt to spare feelings, oftentimes the guy just doesn't get it and or keeps pushing until I'm really uncomfortable. I felt guilty until I listened past my music, and heard loud conversation going on near me. Taking my headphones off, I could hear the same guy yelling out an insane and angry rant that was directed at me. The point I tuned in at, he was saying something about slitting wrists. He was calling me a tease, and saying that I led him on, that I didn't give him any good reason, and why wouldn't I just take his number? I had said exactly five words to the guy, and four of them being, I have a boyfriend, a pretty valid reason. Besides, I don't owe him a reason for not being interested. Then he got into a rage about how, apparently, sunlight was reflecting off my phone and into his eyes, and I was sending him mixed signals. At this point I got out and readied my pepper spray, just in case. I'm a very small woman, about 5 foot 2 and 118 pounds. He was much bigger. He got up, apparently too pissed off to even sit near me, and stormed off to the front of the bus. As he passed me, he looked me right in the eye and said, Be glad I don't have a gun. He puts two fingers to his head and pulled the trigger. His ranting just got loud and worse when he sat down towards the front of the bus. It would vary between angry growling that I could barely hear, to shouting directly at me. He called me names said something referring to between my legs, made a comment about how someday someone would take it from me. He said a whole slew of things, all of which sounded crazy and incoherently threatening. I was scared and terrified. Not a single person on the bus seemed to notice this man harassing me, these horrible things he was saying. I sat there, stiff as a board, clutching my pepper spray, scared to ignore him completely in case he got up and came after me. It was at this point that the driver, a young woman, pulled the bus over and told him he needed to leave. He argued and yelled at her, eventually saying he would just shut up, that he needed to be on this bus. 
She shrugged, picked up the radio, presumably to call the police, and at this point he gave in and got off the bus. When I got to my stop at the end of the route, I waited to be the last person and thank the driver, who immediately asked me if I was okay and told me that the man getting off had alerted her to what was going on. She was amazed that no one else was doing anything about it. She told me, her words, that if he hadn't gotten off when he did, she was about to fuck him up. I thanked her again and got to work, where it took me several hours to even stop shaking. I spent the whole shift scared that he caught the next bus and was headed for the mall, and that he would see me and find out where I were. I spent the next week terrified that he would find me at the bus stop we were both at, or even on the bus, and this time he would have a gun. Like I said, I have to take that bus upwards of seven times a week. I've had some pretty scary encounters in the past, and I'll probably share them at some point, but I had never been made to feel that unsafe. My bus route was long, and I was one of the last stops. It was on a really rural road with lots of mountains, dirt roads, and hollowways. Being a rural area, most of these hollows were long, windy roads that families and relatives lived on, and normally just one to two families of kids to be dropped off at the same points. This meant that if a particular family of kids didn't ride the bus that day, for whatever reason, that the bus driver could skip the hollow and save us anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes off the total route. How could this ever be a bad thing, right? Well, one particular hollow had only two stops, but the second family lived at the furthest point. It was easily three or four miles past the first family's drop-off point, down a crooked, dead-end, single-lane dirt road. It was the worst part of the route each time. Now, on days the second family did not ride the bus, if the driver skipped driving all the way to the second family's house, then it would save a 20 minute round trip. Not to mention the stress of driving on the claustrophobic dirt road in a huge, hulking school bus. There were also times the family waited to pick up the kids in their own car at the first drop off, to save the bus time and spare it the experience of driving that road. So, of course, when they could, the driver would turn around at the first family's drop-off point. However, this was not as smooth a turn as going the full way to the second family's house. This drop-off point was a small circular area with a couple different driveways sprawling off, and definitely not big enough for a bus to do a 360 turn in one swoop. But, with the help of one larger driveway, a three-point turn could get us out there easy, at most, the bus needed two meters of this driveway space, and hardly 30 seconds of its time. We do this happily for as long as I can remember, until either new residents moved in, or the existing residents of the trailer in this driveway, about 20 meters away, lost their minds. Suddenly, there's a large red farm gate at the extreme end of the driveway. There's no possible way for the bus to turn around when closed. For the first few months, whenever we could cut this route short by turning there, the driver would stop the bus during the three-point turn, open the gate, barely reverse into the driveway, pull out, stop the bus again, close the gate back exactly as it was, and get back on the bus and carry on saving us all 20 minutes of needless driving. Keep in mind, this only happened when the second family either did not ride the bus or was being picked up at this point so it was not very often. Then, one day, we turn up and there's now a lock on the gate. Huh. So we drive the 20 minutes and carry on. Still, each time we have the chance to turn, the driver would check if it was unlocked. I do not know if it was ever requested to leave it unlocked, but I know from the driver's reaction they wanted it to be. So, if it did happen to be unlocked, we would take the shortcut and the driver would put the gate back as it was. To my knowledge, no one ever complained about this. Then comes the day of the trap. We get to the first drop off. The second family was not riding the bus. Nothing looks amiss, except 
Hey, what do you know? The gate is open. I can remember the smile on the driver's face as she put the bus in reverse and begins to turn. At this point in the ride, it's just myself and three to four other kids. Only one being a grade above me and I was barely six years old. Of course I was chattering away with my friend and I did not notice at first that we had stopped. Once I did start to look around however, to my confusion, there was an assortment of ATVs and actual cars that had pulled out of the side driveways to surround the bus every single direction. To make it even more confusing and thinking back, horrific, they all had an assortment of firearms. Yes, guns. Now, I'm six, and I grew up around guns. I wasn't scared by what I saw, but I also didn't realize I was being held hostage at gunpoint. All I remember is the feeling of profound confusion of not being able to A. Work out why we were sitting there B. What these people were doing and C. Why are the other kids crying? Maybe I was blissfully ignorant, but the driver told us to play on the floor and not to look out the windows. So, me being me, I propped my jacket up over the window in my seat and told everyone we could play under my row, and I ended up having a great, albeit slightly boring time waiting. It went on for what felt like hours, and I never looked out the window stirring it, but I'm sure it was really only an hour at most, give or take, because our parents slowly started showing up looking for us. I remember two kids being allowed off before me. Then as I was growing truly bored, my grandfather showed up to save me too. He came onto the bus, spoke to the driver, and held my hand as we walked back to his truck. No one else saying a word except my cheery goodbye to the driver. I remember all of the gang just staring her down as I walked away. She never moved from her seat the entire ordeal. I don't know what happened after I left. It was only later that I grew up to realize the severity of the event. I know for sure my grandfather and my parents called the school system, but I never heard of any punishment or follow-up. The gate was never left open again, and we still had to drive that route each day, always driving it all the way through. The same driver stayed on the route. She was honestly an angel to remain so calm and collected throughout. Back in 2013, I was living with my ex at the time, who lived near a nice country village, and as I was in between jobs at the time, I picked up a job at a local garden center. It was casual retail work, fairly decent pay, and easy going enough that I could take coffee breaks frequently, and wear basically whatever I liked as long as I wore my work polo shirt. It was walking distance from my ex's house and full of people of all ages who were the most lovely people I ever met. Most of the regular customers who came to the garden center were usually sweet old people who would visit the cafe, because we had free teas and discounted lunches for OAPs if they had a store card, so you often got to know all of them, and some of them we gave nicknames. Most of them sweet like Pink Hair Lady, a badass 80-year-old grandma who wore a tasseled leather jacket and bright pink hair, then there was Camper Van Couple, who used to drive a really cool camper van with bright orange flowers painted on it. You get the idea. With Creepy Artist Man, though, he gave most of the young girls weird vibes. He wore a straw hat, was in his late 40s, had round gold rimmed glasses, and would wear strange graphic shirts with naked women on them. Or professional pussy patrol sort of slogans on the back. He always wore ripped jeans where his knees were always hanging out of them, which were always dirty with paint or mud or something. He had this weird half-smile that would never leave his face, and he had this leer that made people feel uncomfortable. He would take off his glasses and clean them constantly, which kind of made you feel like he was trying to get a better look at the girls who worked there, especially the younger ones, 16-plus school leavers usually. Anyway... It was a roasting hot summer's day, and I had gratefully accepted the job of watering the hanging baskets outside, where I could avoid the humid, sweaty heat of the greenhouses. I was wearing black shorts and my red polo, and my tool belt to prune and deadhead plants as I went. 
With the hose in my hand and Sonny's on my face, I was busy but enjoying the solitary job at the quietest part of the garden center. Well, hello there. Out of practically nowhere, he slipped out behind some wooden trellises and looked me up and down, smiling with his weird, too small teeth. His eyes lingered on me for what felt like an uncomfortable few seconds, and I turned off my hose and asked him if there's anything he needed. He shook his head and kind of shrugged, still smirking at my legs. Okay, sir. Have a nice day. Let me know if you need anything. I turned to continue. I've never seen you here before. You're a new one, he said. Huh? Me? Well, I've been here for eight months now. I must have missed the memo that a beauty like you started. You have a nice tan. You look young. Uh, thanks. I'm 23. Anyways, I have to get back to work, I said. Nice to meet you, Jessica. I suddenly remembered my name badge. I get slightly irritated that he now knew my full name. I make a beeline for the smoking area where the tool shed was, with an excuse to grab some smaller gardening gloves. And by the time I returned to the floor, he had left. As the weeks went by, he would come into the store regularly, usually mid-afternoon, coincidentally around the time I started my shift. Most of the time I was the only cashier, so I would have to serve him. He would buy the most smallest, pointless things, like floristry wire or a tiny bag of birdseed. It seemed like he would purposely make a purchase with the intention of interacting with me. He would make comments about my appearance, statements like, you have your hair different today. Yesterday you had it down. You have new glasses. That's a different lip color to yesterday. He would always announce my name loudly and deliberately during every interaction. I felt uncomfortable, but I was 23 and just politely shrugged it off. Around Christmas time, I was decorating the artificial trees, and he cornered me in the forest of them in the back of the store. He jumped out from behind one of them and made me jump. To which I was kind of pissed about him doing that because I dropped a glass ornament and it smashed. He bent down also and tried to help, grabbing my wrist and telling me not to touch the glass. His grip was scarily tight and forceful and his hands were clammy and gross. I slipped my hand out of his grip and asked him if I could help him with anything. That's when it got weird. He pulled a leaflet out from his back pocket and told me he was an artist. He had a Christmas art show happening in the local church hall, and he wanted me to go with him. He told me that he was a painter, and he thought I would like his work. I asked him if he wanted me to pin the leaflet to the local event board, and he reached out and touched my arm and said, No, the invitation is specifically for you. He pointed his finger and jabbed it into my chest and said, You. So I'm standing there in a dark corner, obscured from view by artificial Christmas trees, just kind of cornered by this guy who was touching me. I cringed away and said, I'm busy with my boyfriend that day. Sorry. And I kind of scampered off. I remember feeling really strange after that, the fact he grabbed my wrist and jabbed his finger into my chest that way. I told a few of my colleagues about it, and they all told me they would warn me the next time he was in the store so I could maybe hang out in the storeroom until he was gone. Well, that memo must have missed a few temp Christmas stuff, because one day I get told by one, your friend is asking for you at the tills. It wasn't unusual for my friends to stop by, as it was fairly popular for gifts and that kind of thing. So thinking it was maybe my ex's mom or something, I head to the till, and there he is. He's holding a piece of paper. I cringe, but he had seen me now. So I walked over and asked what he needed of me. He passed the paper over and asked me to open it. Folded up was a drawing of me, with an exaggerated chest and cartoon-like eyes, watering the hanging baskets in a sexual kind of position. I kind of stood there and said thank you, but I couldn't keep it as I thought it was inappropriate to take gifts from customers. I handed it back to him and he kind of looked at me with this angry stare. He turned around and walked out without another word. By this point, I had had enough. I knocked on my manager's door and told him about the whole scenario that just happened. 
and all the previous interactions I'd had with him over the past year. He watched the CCTV and agreed that it was so strange the way he gave me this gross picture, and he told me he would talk to him if he ever came back. He praised me for my reaction to his advances and said I was doing the right thing and he said he would try and see him off the next time. The next day was a Sunday and I was not due into work. My boss calls me and tells me he just received a call from HQ stating that an anonymous caller had called in to report a staff member inappropriately coming on to a customer. The staff member they had described and named was me. The caller had said that I, had been inappropriate towards him at work, offered to have sex with him, had led him on, and obviously promiscuous, and that I had been pursuing him for over a year. The jerk even described a fictitious relationship we'd had, and ranted loudly about how I'd been cheating on my boyfriend before hanging up. HQ luckily didn't believe a word, as my manager had already mentioned the guy to one of the higher-ups but they thought it was wise to let me know about this crazy guy and suggest I report it to the police. The next day, I did just that. The officer I spoke to said that he matched the description of the man who was a local pest, somebody who often harasses young girls in the local area. He was also known to stalk girls in his car and had attempted to abduct a young girl four years ago. The police officers assured me that they would file a report and talk to him officially, and that he was not allowed in the garden center or anywhere near me again, and if he did, I was to call the police and he would be arrested. Unfortunately though, it never stopped him sending a ranting letter to my workplace addressed to me, saying he would kill himself if I didn't take him back and receive his gift he drew of me. Fortunately, the police saw this as unsolicited contact, and he was thankfully arrested. Years ago, on a beautiful early September afternoon, my brother and a couple of his friends, and me and a couple of mine, went to a local county fair. While there, we met a group of four guys in merged groups. We were having so much fun that we decided to keep the party going after we left the fair. Everyone followed me to my apartment, where we called another friend, whose family owned the local single-story motel. She hooked us up with a room at the end, far away from the other guests, and we were off to the races. It was a fun night. Lots of laughing, conversation, drinking, all that. I really enjoyed chatting with one of the new guys, but there was another one who I didn't like. He was very competitive with the other guys, bragging himself up and constantly making fun of them. He didn't add anything interesting to conversations. He wasn't very bright and had a locker room style humor that I've never enjoyed. No biggie, not everybody clicks. I probably didn't say more than a couple of words to him that night. The party eventually ended and everyone went their separate ways. A couple of weeks later, I'm home on a Saturday night when the doorbell rings. I open it up and it was that annoying guy. He told me that he's cruising town with a friend, asked if I'd like to join them. I was honestly pretty bored so I agreed to go and then we headed downstairs. The car was the type with two bucket seats in the front that dipped between them with an emergency brake in it and a bench seat in the back. When the annoying guy told me to slide over in the front to sit between him and the driver, I laughed and said that wouldn't be comfortable at all, and I climbed into the back. We started rolling, and I noticed that the driver was not one of the three guys we met at the fair. I felt a bit disappointed, but sucked it up. After all, the annoying guys of the friends were amazing, and this guy might be too. I threw out a conversation starter, crickets from the driver and more urging from the annoying guy to crawl into the front seat. I try another topic, same response, and now I'm picking up tense vibes from the driver. I don't know what the annoying guy had intended, but alarm bells were going off and I wanted out. I coolly tapped the driver on the shoulder, said I decided to go home and turn in early and he promptly turned around and headed back to my place. 
In the five minutes I was in his car, he hadn't said one word to me, but I swear, I felt him relax immediately when I ended the evening. Once home, I got out of the car as fast as I could and said bye, and then proceeded up the walk. I heard the car back up and drive away with relief, but when I got to the door of my building, something made me turn around. That annoying guy was right behind me. I was pissed. You'd better run if you want to catch your ride, I said. It's too late. I'll never catch him. Guess you're walking home in the dark then, I replied. Okay, but I need to use your bathroom first. So, folks, I ended up saying okay for a lot of predictable reasons. I was young, didn't have much of a backbone, and had been raised like most girls, to be polite. It was obvious he was creeping on me. He might have actually had dark intentions. I was furious with him, and I still said okay. Everything turned out alright, but I still hate that that's what happened. Please learn from my mistakes. Fuck politeness. I let us into the apartment and stay by the door while he uses the bathroom. He comes out and sits on the far right end of the couch. He kind of slides back cups his hand behind his neck and puts his fucking feet on my coffee table. Then, wearing an I win grin, he tells me he's not going anywhere. I stand there numbly for a bit, flipping through my options. At this point, I'm standing in front of a narrow piece of wall between the door on my right and the end of the sofa on my left, both within touching distance. The outrage and fury overtake me, and I know what I'm gonna do. I surprise him by grabbing a shirt front with both hands, pulling him up and to the right, then shoving him against the narrow wall space. I place my left forearm across his chest, pin him with all my weight, all while opening the door with my right hand. I hold the door with my right foot, grab his shirt front again and push him into the hall. All this happened lightning quick. As the door was closing in his face, he said, but I'll have to walk all the way across town. I yelled through the door. You should have thought about that before you got out of the damn car. I never saw him again, but a few weeks later, there was a knock at my door. I answered. It was a local man with cerebral palsy, flanked by two of his buddies. He told me he wanted to take me out for a really nice dinner and to buy me a bottle of champagne. The champagne comment was so random and specific that it kept spinning in the back of my head. I told him no, that I do not date strangers, and I thought it was bizarre he was doing this. As they turned to go, the pieces fell into place, and I said, wait a minute, were you told to come here by a short, red-headed guy? He confirmed that that was the case, and all these years later, I believe the guy was told by the other guy that I was a prostitute. And that bottle of champagne was my code phrase for customers. Such a nasty little creep. This story took place about four years ago. I was 16 and 5 foot 6. Who either looked like a 12 year old boy or a 16 year old tomboy depending on the person. At the time as well, I suffered with really bad anxiety. You could definitely see it on my body language. I was definitely visually an easy target for predators. So, I was a 16-year-old kid just picking up hardbacks from my last year in school. After I was done shopping, I decided to get a tram back to my dad's workplace, and then he would take me home from there. It was a Sunday morning, pretty chilly, and it definitely had an uneasy feeling. I hated going into town alone, but no one else was available to join me, so I sucked it up and did the deed. The trams were new at the time, and I'd only taken them two or three times, so I was definitely hypervigilant on them, especially since I suffer with anxiety. Hypervigilant so I didn't miss my stop, and hypervigilant that nothing weird happens, as the tram was notorious for weird people. I walked to my tram stop and I wait. I see the next tram is soon, but there is a guy making me unbelievably uneasy. 
I hate assuming the worst of people, but this man was making me so uncomfortable. Nothing in particular was off about him. He looked a bit scruffy, but not a predator. So I decided to walk away from the stop for a bit and wait for the tram coming to pass, then return, and then get on the one after. They come often enough, and this guy was giving me the creeps. I walk away for a bit, take a nice relaxing stroll to calm myself down, and return to the stop. He's still there. When I left, he definitely watched me leave and waited for me to return. Now at the time I was doubting myself. I was telling myself I was being irrational. Something like a creepy guy following me couldn't surely happen to me. I was wrong. We get on the tram. My tram takes me about five stops to my dad's workplace. I walk down the tram a bit. The man was still in my eye line and I was in his. Now my dad's workplace is about a five minute stroll from my stop, but it is a walk down a quiet area. An area that someone could easily assault you, or even take you, and not many would notice, especially on a Sunday morning. At each stop, I'm praying this guy gets off the tram, but he doesn't. My anxiety has hit the roof. Although the tram walk is only five minutes, I call my dad to pick me up right outside the station. My dad surprisingly obliges. I think he could tell something was off with me. So all I had to do was walk out of the tram station and make it to the car. I still had hope in my heart that this guy would not get off at my station and go to the next one instead. It comes to my stop. I get off. And of course the creep gets off too. No one else gets off. It's just us two. Fuck. The guy looks at me and I look at him. We make eye contact. I could tell he was planning on walking in my direction and follow me out. I can see him panic a bit and then he walks in the opposite direction of me. Now the chilling part about this is. The station has only one exit. This man turns around and walks onto the tracks of the tram and just wanders off. I didn't stay too long to see if he would come back and I sped walk to my dad's car. When I get into my dad's car, I double check with him that there's only one exit to the station as the tram is only new and I was unfamiliar with it. He says yes, there is only one exit and just then I get covered in goosebumps. This man waited for me to get onto the tram even though he could have taken an earlier one. He followed me to the station and decided last minute to abort mission. I have tried to rationally explain this to myself. Maybe he wasn't following me and he was just a weird guy. But why did his presence make me feel so uneasy that I decided to walk away and wait for the next tram? Why did he wait for the next tram when he could have gotten an earlier one? What are the chances of the man getting off at the same stop as me? Why did he not use the exit and walk onto the tram's tracks instead? It's not like I gave him a death stare. We just made eye contact when we got off the tram. I was a 5 foot 6, 16 year old kid. Definitely not intimidating. All I know about this experience is that I was glad my dad picked me up outside the station. I never want to experience the feeling of being followed again. I was in high school, a freshman or sophomore, so about 14 to 15 years old, but I still looked much younger. I rode the city bus to school because no school buses routed to my neighborhood. My mom could have dropped me off at the time, but she started work at 8 and my school started at 9, so I really wasn't interested at being at school at around 7.15. That morning, I get on the bus as usual. It's not empty, but not full. I was part of the J. Rotsi in high school, and that was uniform day, so I'm wearing my uniform. If you've ever seen female military uniforms, you know that they're the least flattering thing in the world. I include this description in case there's any chuckle fucks out there who think that what you're wearing when you get creeped on make a difference. So I'm sitting in my seat, surrounded by my big ass backpack and a guitar case from a music class. Suddenly this guy just materializes in front of me. I look up and I see this guy. Average height, sandy colored, thin hair, and drug skinny with a tweaker face. 
He could be anywhere from 20 to 40. He stands awkwardly in front of me and then thrusts his arm out and holds a folded piece of paper in front of me. He gestures for me to take it. It's so early in the morning and I'm so confused that I take it and he walks away. I open it and read it. It read, Hey, my name is Chris. I've been watching you for a while now, but I'm switching houses soon, so here's my phone number. Call me. He had written his number down. I can barely process what I've just read, and I can just feel his eyes on me. I arrange my stuff in the back seat around me like a barrier, and when my stop comes, I fly off the bus. I ran to the Rotsy building where I would usually hang out before school. I burst into the building and basically tackled one of the ROTC instructors and clung to him, shaking like a leaf and crying, holding the note and talking incoherently. Now our instructor was obviously retired military. He took the note from me, read it, and got the most steely-eyed look. He sat me down in a chair and walked over to the school phone on the table. He calmly dialed the number, and that dumb, creepy fuck answered. My instructor asked if his name was Chris. The guy said yes, and he quickly told him that he was my father, and asked, Why in the fuck did you, a grown man, give my 14-year-old child your phone number? The creep didn't have anything to say other than ah uh, and well. My instructor released a stream of very experienced, ex-military based threats, until he could hear the guy just about shit his pants. He finally told him to never contact me again and hung up, and he gave me a huge smile and a hug. I was smiling through my tears at that point, having listened to his tirade. I called my mom, told her what happened, and she came down to the school and we went and filed a police report. I told her I was never getting on a city bus again, and I didn't care if I had to be at school two hours early. I wanted her to drop me off until I could drive, so that's what happened. The instructor was always my favorite teacher, and I still go visit him, even after graduating college. I imagine someday, at my wedding, he'll tell this story. I was 18 at the time. I lived in a suburb of a large city and attended that city's university. I did not yet have a vehicle and public transportation in my city is pretty shit. Only buses, but they didn't go out to my neighborhood, so I had to take the charter bus to the city. I then had to get about three more buses to get to the university. During this time, I'd gotten quite used to being catcalled and stared at, sometimes even followed for short distances. I always carried pepper spray, and since it was always broad daylight, I was never too concerned. But one day, I missed my first bus, meaning in order to catch the next one if I wanted to get to class on time, I'd have to walk five blocks down one street, then turn right for three more blocks. About halfway through my trek, I noticed a very large, unkempt man following me. He seemed very unstable. As I finally approached my stop, I grew cold, realizing that the man was also stopped waiting for the bus. I started to feel that detached, autopilot feeling. I just need to get to school, then I'll be fine, I remember thinking. Just then, another man riding a bike rode past us, looped around, stopped, and waited beside me. When the bus got there, I got on the bus, then the big man. The man on the bike put his bike on the front of the bus, and he got on and sat in the seat beside me. He did not say one word to me. After a couple of stops, the man got off rather abruptly, quite quickly, and when he did, the man on the bike also got off and rode back the way we came. I was very scared, but I think the man on the bike was looking out for me that day. I wish I could thank him for being there for me. A scared girl just a few months out of high school, and a total stranger. Thank you to the man on the bike. I hope you're doing well. Hey guys, thanks for watching. 
do me a favor and hit the like button and comment. Let me know what you thought of the video. Don't forget to subscribe as well, and hit the bell icon as well so you can stay notified whenever I release a new video. Now if you fancy checking out my channel memberships or Patreon, or any of my social media, all my links can be found in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Cassie Fowler, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kel, Monica Level 8, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Sham, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well.